stop your video okay this is to reduce the bandwidth uh, so whoever has joined make sure that your audio is off and your video is off guys you can continue okay yeah um, essentially and so we have come a long way uh, from where we started with our bit since our training day so since the time of deciding how to explore when to explore looking at a pns or just an axial section ct now we precisely know with uh, imaging so imaging has made a lot of difference and then of course with it the other improvements like your approaches and armamentarium and the biometrics available so i think i totally agree with that because uh, when you're looking at uh, huge milestones in orbital surgery you know in the last uh, 20 25 years or 30 years uh, one significant uh, change that has overcome the whole world uh, is the um, imaging systems exactly now, yeah. because primarily orbital surgery uh, hinges on imaging systems as we see it today you know and, and- and now the next jump i am seeing is with the pre surgical planning and uh, positioning and maybe navigation and patient specific Correct. implants what, what we call as guided to, guided surgery guided surgery pre surgical planning guided surgery and psis which are going to add more refinements to it and so that i think then that way we are becoming more and more predictable very true more controlled and uh, and it's improving results of course so and Correct. from when to explore now we are deciding how to explore what to do what to use and everything the narrative has changed incidentally exactly. as, so, as a background uh, to everybody who has joined us uh, recently see uh, rudy in fact comes from a unit which is very famous for its guided surgeries the concept of guided surgeries for the orbit in the world started uh, in germany uh, with uh, the uh, prima facie being taken by uh, freiburg you know uh, Professor Schmelzeisen was the first person who initiated uh, going for guided surgery in the orbits, uh, and that was the earliest uh, instances where a full team was actually focusing a lot on guided surgery for the orbit. And uh, he had two able uh, uh, colleagues, junior colleagues, one of whom happens to be Niels Claudius Gelrich, who is now the chair at uh, Hanover, and the third one being uh, Professor Alexander Schramm from Ulm, uh, also in Germany. Okay. So these are the primary okay. three uh, giants who started uh, guided surgery for the orbits, and slowly and steadily they started moving uh, all over Germany, establishing these concepts, which has now uh, taken the world by storm. And another uh, that, important, uh, in- yeah. Another country uh-huh. which is uh, to be looked at okay. is Switzerland. Hello, Kanan. Hello. Yes, I can yeah, hear I, you. Yeah, I'm yeah. listening. Yeah, we can uh, hear. Bye. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So uh, that is one good reason for us to have Rudy here because he comes from uh, a very uh, structured pedigree, if I can say that. <laughs> so, yeah. you, you, you've got to live up to the reputation now. <laughs> He's put the pressure yeah. on you. <laughs> but 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 this is true. This is really true. What you just said. So yeah. No. Absolutely. My, my boss. Uh, so he he. he was one of the the guys who pushed this very forward and at the beginning in germany all the old uh, or maxilla facial surgeon they were laughing at him yeah like calling okay. them navigation surgeons and what uh, you are too stupid to operate and all this stuff and and now everybody is is doing it like this that's true so yeah that that is visionary isn't it that is visionary yeah exactly for all the old yeah. guys from ao said why do you need a navigation why do you need a ct scan for orbital fracture so this has completely changed within the last uh, maybe 20 years yeah so now no one is now Absolutely. no one is, uh, is arguing about this questioning anymore. questioning anymore no. this is completely now actually everyone wants to know how to fund it basically it is changed yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. absolutely true absolutely true yeah yeah But by the way, I promised one person, Rudy. When you visited Amrit Sir, one of the fellows who was there, Amit might know. Sarita had met you there, and she wanted me to tell hello to you on her behalf. She so was. Hal- uh, she went to Zurich. Was the lady who went to no, Zurich? No, no, no. She didn't come to Zurich, but I think she met you in uh, Amrit Sir when you visited Amrit Sir. Yes. So one of the residents there. So. 
she was an ever smiling girl so maybe if you see her you'll remember amit will send you her pic <laughs> Sarita Mahajan, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, that's okay. I'll tell her. I'll tell her you remember. She'll, she'll be happy. <laughs> <laughs> so now, um, I think as we are getting close, just a reiteration of what Dr. Pramod Shubhash said. May we request all the participants to block their audio as well as video, so it will reduce the bandwidth and it will. not interrupt the presentation one and two if possible everyone please hear with your earphones if possible yes i'm here that will improve the audio quality the, uh, and also cut out the external noise so this is for all people viewing on uh, zoom now well, um, i think as we are getting close just a reiteration of what dr pramod shubhash said may we request all the participants to block their audio as well as video so we reduce the bandwidth and i think not in front of the presentation one and two if possible everyone please hear with your earphones if possible yes and that will improve the audio quality and also cut out the external noise so this is for all people viewing on uh, so another uh, housekeeping announcement uh, please the word of the promotion to us that may we request all the participants to block their audio as well as video to make the event another housekeeping announcement is whoever is logged into zoom please address your questions to either dr anand or myself kanan so so to the co-host so and we will direct it to the speaker so don't direct anything to everyone because it will just clog the screens and it will obstruct the screens it will pop up so direct it to the co-host it will be either dr anand narayan or kanan or even so maybe dr amit yeah Can you can you please give me your email address that, that I can send you the PDF because it's it's a, it's, a big... it's it's in the group Rudy. It's in the group, okay? Yeah, yeah. It's already posted in the WhatsApp in the group. group, Rudy. Okay. Got it? It's not yet. Just give me a sec. It's my mobile. the the incisions also started taking a turn as we grew more confident and so, so now we have moved on to ourselves to transcending table but i think it needed a big leap of faith um for us to move from extra orbital incision skin and cutaneous to the transcending table ones and now that yes. you've started doing it it's much more convenient and easy correct yeah mm-hmm. See, these these are mind blocks which mind uh, which, blocks. Uh, which uh, But, happen as we yeah. progress on a particular path, and uh, unless yeah. we have some focused initiative uh, in terms of expelling the fears of these, then you start realizing okay, they are yeah. so much more convenient, yeah. and uh, why the hell were we not using it earlier? But, But having said that, some people still get excellent results with uh, cutaneous incision. Very true. Very well. true. Very for, true. For example, Dr. Gopal still swears by it. how or much we try can convincing him he still says i am comfortable i so totally believe grows... in this. <laughs> hello hello lord support hello yes yeah i'm i'm just trying to yeah, send you mail separate hall- hello so that that that's true but but still there are some um how can i say a very bad results with the transcutaneous the risk is just a little lower with with the uh, transconjunctival approach and it's 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 more forgiving to be honest true. because it, you don't it, see exactly exactly you don't see it's true. more forgiving yeah you can get away with that, a little bit of very much the, that's very much the uh, ophthalmic or orbital uh, analogy to intraoral or transoral incisions <laughs> incisions exactly yeah. so guys i think uh, we are close okay uh is, is are... amit ready yeah Hello. i'm i'm ready no, hi no no okay. not, not yet just... no no not yet you don't have to i'm just checking if amit is on there <clears throat> and you've got what you need amit yeah not... yeah okay. amit so... is yes amit is just... uh... Some, uh, I, amit I yeah hi pramod yeah i can listen to you rudy you're ready no not yet not yet just just another uh Just give me two minutes, and yeah, then yeah, I sure. might be ready. Yeah, because, yeah, take your, um, take your time. Sure.
sure in the meantime in the meantime uh, i uh, i will request uh, amit uh, to introduce you okay yeah no uh, i need, I need no, a little him, more let him be online pramod, need, pramod sorry let him okay, be let, let ready me just give be, yeah give yeah, him yeah, sure. time yeah yeah give sure, him sure, time sure, we'll, sure. we'll just keep sure. the commentary going, going on yeah, the yeah. the other way we switched on from as you said anand from bone grafts to biomaterials i think the biggest jump was the preformed implants though the mesh was there we were contouring and we were still confident on the the preformed implants have slightly nudged us better towards the meshes but, but there is, yeah there is a, there but is, still there's another step in the evolution of these implants I, we know which, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which is even 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 more, even more better more. No, we we are talking from our training days. We are just coming up. Okay, sure. <laughs> we are we are uh, yeah, we are, we are keeping it warm expect- for you. Yeah. Uh, Kanan, uh, the, yeah. the thing about uh, implants being used, you know, let's try to understand how the concept of implants usage varies. Mm-hmm. See, the moment you start uh, getting more confident into exposing all the areas of the orbit that are required right. for addressing a problem, the chance for you to push something extra is always. Uh, you know earlier the concept was uh, try to open as less as possible okay ha huh? yeah you know and you hardly got enough space to push in uh, 10 or 15 mm of a uh, strip of uh, mesh inside in the anterior third of the orbit and then start working you know now yeah. slowly what's happening is we are seeing that more and more uh, surgeons the maxillofacial surgeons are getting uh, confident to explore the orbit open the orbit using- oh yes okay so what happens is you you see more of the area being visible and you you start using implants which are more optimal yeah, so okay um for i sent an email to you with v transfer you will get okay. an email from v transfer and then you can download the pdf okay rodi that sh- should should be working now hopefully let's check it out Okay okay There is some disturbance which we are getting Yeah it's from oh, yeah, Dr yeah. Shraddha No no not necessarily him uh, not necessarily him it might be the thing with zoom so No the mic, the mic shows it's... the audio disturbance is actually Yes yes so once the Ah okay So please tell me when you want me to share the screen then right yes sir yeah, just give us uh, not on give us not a... on between the video screen pe not on between video my phone Did you receive the email? Yeah, yeah, uh, but it'll take a while to to, to download. download. Yeah, <laughs> but of course the, the videos so, you you cannot. Uh, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. It's, worries, a, it's so. a PDF. Uh, Ramod, are you in? Hmm? Ramod, can you hear me? I can hear you. I can hear you. Yeah, I, I'm. I'm. Um, I think we can. we can start if uh, pramod is in Thank <laughs> you. 
not show between the videos screen okay i think um we um i think we should be ready to start uh, anand amit okay you unmute yourself and if um, if rudy is ready to share the screen yes sir no, no 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 i am not okay not already screen supported video nahi aicha mo bar me dekha guys can i before we start, can i request the new joiners to stop your videos and audio the people who are participating it please switch off your video and audio me no 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 the new sorry. joinees okay <laughs> not the presenter sorry <laughs> the host and co-host so we are getting new people joining and we are seeing their screen come up so of course no no sir great mobile support kar rahe hain great mobile support kar rahe hain isliye sir main aapka video nahi dekh pa raha hu aila one tv varti ba tv varti youtube launch dena aila tv varti youtube ke rudi rudi welcome to india this is uh, this is something you need to get used to okay we have we have a multitude of languages yeah please, please understand that this is a very diverse country nahi aila tv varti it almost uh, 200 languages wow yeah that's impressive uh, as as many as the, as the number of participants you might get languages also in get used to it i i try <laughs> Hello guys. Uh, Amit can you hear me? Uh, I can hear you in between Pritam is calling so I have to take this Okay call. so so listen there's there's some uh, something wrong at the admin part where uh, the screen is stuck okay so that, that's the reason why uh, it is getting uh, stuck after that is resolved we will immediately uh, uh, start the meeting yeah in the meantime in the meantime all the other participants kindly turn your uh, audio off and video off sunit gupta please turn yes sir turn your audio off please turn your audio off mute your audio please
Amit. Yeah, Pramod, I can hear you. Can you hear me? In the meantime, in the meantime, in the meantime, uh, uh, do you want to introduce uh, Rudy? Yeah. So okay, can you can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, uh, it's a it's a privilege that uh, I have to. Uh, I have been given a task to introduce uh, one of a very good friend of mine, so Rudiger Martin Zimmerer. He is a con consultant craniomaxillofacial surgeon from Hanover Medical School, Germany, also called as MHH, and it is a prolific center for AOCMF uh, fellowship in which I was also there in 2017. So Rudiger is an excellent surgeon with the special interest in orbital trauma. I would say navigation assisted orbital uh, trauma and guided surgery as Anant and uh, Kanan has mentioned the TMJ reconstruction, that would total TMJ reconstruction and uh, microvascular surgery. And he is an apt researcher, and he is a part of various international research projects, uh, specifically in cancer biology, tissue engineering, biomaterials, and stem cells. And he has got many research publications under his belt. So uh, welcome, Rudy, uh, to India. Uh, the association it's a huge family association of oral and maxillofacial surgeons of India. And uh, welcome, welcome. His topic, uh, uh, everyone knows, orbital reconstruction and uh, uh, current concepts in orbital reconstruction and uh, treatment of NOE fractures. Welcome. Thank you very much, Amit, uh, for hosting the session. Thank everybody else in the audience and to the organizers and especially to AOSMI um, for giving me the chance to give you a presentation about current concepts in orbital reconstruction. So I think I have to now uh, share my screen. Yeah. Is this correct? Yes, please go ahead. And I hope everything is now working and you can see the screen. Yes. <clears throat> okay. So <clears throat> when we talk about uh, orbital surgeries, I think there are two main symptoms and signs which we have to take into consideration. This is anophthalmos and hypoglobus. So these are the most frequent post-traumatic orbital deformities we can see. And that brings us to the question, why do we have to reconstruct the orbit? Because some people tell you and will tell you this is just elective surgery. There is no real need behind it because people won't die. We do restore the orbit because uh, we want to keep the soft and hard tissues back again in alignment. And um, if this cavity is kept to the right dimensions and the right volume, this will have a direct um, effect on the position of the globe. The second indication should be that we should avoid that secondarily dystopia of the globe like anosomus and hypoglobus will arise. There's another more ophthalmological reason. So some people develop diplopia, however, this is not a high frequency uh, or high frequency of patients that develop this complication. Usually in the very beginning, there is no diplopia because the swelling is still trying to keep the bulb where it is. And when the swelling goes down, the brain is able to more or less compensate the diplopia. There are only a few patients who deliver um, diplopia when they present to you in the emergency department. There's another very important reason we want to keep the motility free of the globe, especially in children when we have these trapdoor fractures, when the orbital floor just comes back and more or less uh, keeps the, the um, rectal muscle or the soft tissues entrapped. And this will lead to a problem by just showing up the eye to, to, the, um, to the cranial fold. And I think one, one case or one cause um, should be considered very intensely. And this is that we want to avoid secondary reconstructions because we know especially in orbital surgery, especially in midfacial trauma, once you have missed your first chance to do the reconstruction, the second chance is very hard. And this was just stated by Paul Manson and Joe Grass. So these are more or less the, the dinosaurs and the, the pioneers of orbital um, fracture treatment and NOE fracture treatment, which was more or less, this fracture was more or less described the first time by Paul Manson, so the NOE fractures. So this brings us just to uh, the idea, try to do as much as possible in your first shot, because otherwise secondary corrections are very hard and they are very unpredictable. In particular, if you talk about the soft tissues in the orbit, 
And if you want to re re restore uh, already anophthalmic or hypoglobic bulb uh, in a post-traumatic deformity. This is something I want to show you. This is uh, the, the most important reason that we want to do the corrections. This is a patient that was treated in another university hospital in Germany. And you can see that the, um, the outer frame of the orbit, the zygoma, is placed in the wrong or not very good reduced position. And you can also see what kind of soft tissue problems have arised in those patients. And as you all know, this is a very hard uh, to treat deformity secondarily, particularly if the left eye is still um, good to see. And if you now try to correct this eye, there's a higher chance of those people uh, developing um, diplopia or uh, severe problems. So this again, try to avoid secondary corrections by doing the best you can to restore the outer frame and to avoid secondary corrections. Mm -hmm. um, my boss, Professor Nils Claudius Gelrich, and some of his colleagues and friends, they have developed this uh, in the end of the 1990s, at the beginning of the 2000 years. This was just the idea of segmenting the defect, making it visible for the first time. Also segmenting the contralateral side, which might, use, might be used as a template, mirroring it to the contralateral side, and thus giving us more or less a blueprint how the reconstructions then can be um, carried out. This is also not only because of the outer frame, but also for the internal orbital corrections. And most of the time, um, the standard today is using the contralateral orbit and mirror it to the ipsilateral affected side. Everybody knows that the orbit is not symmetric, but again, this gives us the best idea so far in trying to correct those secondary, uh, those um, traumatic um, problems of the orbit. This patient then was used with the old technique by just uh, printing out um, a biomodel of the patient and bending titanium meshes. And you can see on the, uh, on the screen here that um, the colored uh, things are original data. And you can see the violet line, um, which is the reconstructed, reconstructed orbit. And you see the huge discrepancy in the position of the orbital floor. And you can also see the misalignment of the zygoma on the left side. And again, this was corrected by mirroring. And there was another very important um, tool that helped to put the implant at the right position. And this was intraoperative navigation for the first time. And you can also see on the, on the left affected orbit that there's a main, um, main problem uh, in the medial orbital wall, which is not only the medial orbital wall, but it's the posterior medial bulge, which is like a convex structure in the posterior part of the orbit which is more or less pointing into the orbit. And this is what we consider the most important uh, pillar and the most important buttress for not developing anosamos and hypoglobus. So this is something you have to address in your orbital reconstruction. I will come to this later again. And this is the post-operative situation after secondary cor correction of the outer frame. This is, should be the first step. And the second step was, but in the same operation, then trying to lift up the globe and bring it forward. But you can also see that this patient had a deformity in the soft tissue as well, especially in the medial canter ligament, which was fixed in this patient uh, with a wire technique. And I will come back to this later on. So people ask, um, because it's a very expensive uh, way of more or less making intraoperative quality control, whether this intraoperative navigation is a must. And um, I think, it is not a must, but it can really help you and uh, be available for you and give you a better idea of the orbital anatomy. And it's easier for you to find your way along the orbit, especially if it comes to the posterior third in the orbit and close to the, the optic canal. Okay, so again, trying to avoid secondary corrections. And in this um, CT scan, you can see there's a plate in the left orbit and this plate is used to fix the wire and this wire fixes the medial canter ligament. And again, I will come back to the medial canter ligament fixation at, uh, at a later point in my presentation. And in this slide, you can see um, that there was an orbital mesh put into the orbit, but you can clearly see that it was on the wrong position. So it's going down into the maxillary sinus. It's not on top of the posterior shelf, which is here marked in color. 
in the sagittal plane. And um, you can see this huge discrepancy uh, which takes place in the posterior part of the orbit. And this is um, again, together with the posterior medial bulge, these are the, the deformities that cause anophthalmos and hypoglobus. And you can see that someone who put in this titanium mesh was not able to dissect the posterior parts of the orbit, and he was not able to control where he put his implant. But not only the position of the implant is incorrect, but also the shape. So it's like just a flat flying magic carpet in the maxillary sinus, which has no contact to the posterior shelf and which does not have the typical shape of the orbital floor. This is the intraoperative navigation and you can see again the blueprint. And if you take a look at these four pictures, the one with the axial flu uh, view, which is down on the left side, you can see in the violet um, line, this is the posterior medial bulge. And you can see the discrepancy between the original mesh, which was inserted there, the fracture and the real mirrored um, and reconstructed, virtually reconstructed defect. So this, this technique, so intraoperative navigation and the preoperative CT scan really helps you to first identify your defect and then you can uh, correct it later on. So the identification of the problem, this is the most important step and this can only be done by a three-dimensional um, multi-slice and very thin a slice thickness CT scan. This cannot be done by plain radiographs because you won't be able to see the orbit in, in all your three different um, views and you will not be able to find the reason for anosamus and hypoglobus. Is it the malpositioned orbital floor? Is it the wrong shape of the implant? Is it the wrong position of the implant? So these are all these aspects you will not be able to see in two-dimensional um, in two-dimensional um, radiographs. But again, intraoperative navigation is not a must, but it really helps you to get along your way in the orbit. And as you all know, no matter what you do, there, is, there will always be someone who will do it cheaper. And um, just trying to um, um, make fun of you, but um, this is, I think, a picture which really shows it very good. Um, and this is a good, a good picture of how orbital surgery is frequently performed in, in Germany and other European countries. So let's start about, uh, let's talk about navigation first. And you can see this is a picture of our OR. We have a lot of different brain lab and Voxim navigation system. It's like a museum of navigation development over 20 years. And if you want to use navigation for the OR, you of course need the platform. You need the software for planning. You need all these instruments, uh, specially equipment. And again, you need a lot of know-how and skills to check because when you do this for the first time, you have the feeling that you cannot trust navigation. So this is a kind of trusty thing between you and the navigation system that you really know what is showing to you. Rudy, yeah. uh, uh, I want to interrupt you. Uh, uh, can you go back to the slide uh, where you have shown the CT scans and with your cursor, can you, uh, yeah. Uh, can you, can you uh, uh, again uh, discuss what, whatever you have discussed here with your cursor because audience has not understood what you have uh, really spoke here. They uh, can you, can just you, can you sh want you to point and explain. Yes, yeah. um, somehow my pointer is not really uh, working, but, but I would, would your try. cursor move? Your cursor should move on the screen. Is it moving now? Yeah, your cursor moves, but I think you'll have to put it on your uh, uh, slideshow and then move it again. Um, I think I have to change this. In... You, you are out of slideshow, actually. Yes, I know, but, yeah. but you, you don't see um, the pointer here. Just give me a second. I have to make it visible for the, for the presentation. No, it's not working. You, do you have a pointer with you? Do you have a regular pointer with you? You can point it on the system. So that's maybe. okay, Rudy. Uh, I think yeah, I think we progress. should move move ahead because yeah. uh, otherwise there'll be some uh, other technical issue. I think uh, I think we should <laughs> move ahead. Yeah. Don't, don't worry. Yeah. yeah. Don't worry. Yeah. 
So oh, this is this is uh, not not good. So I'm sorry for that. No, no, no. It's it's fine. It's fine. Sorry. It's fine. It's no, fine. No problem. Please go ahead. No, we just wanted it to be a bit more elaborated. That's all. It's perfect. You. Sorry to have interrupted your flow. Please go ahead. But but I can try to to show it. Yeah. Maybe here. Yeah, that's good enough. So okay, let's let's try to do this. So this is the colored um, shape. This is the mirrored orbit from the contralateral side, and uh, behind it, you can see the bone and the fractured orbit. This is the mesh which was put in in the first place. And this is the um, mirrored orbit from the contralateral side. And you can see that the orbital floor is massively dislocated. So the reconstruction is far at the wrong position, especially the transition zone between medial wall and orbital floor. And this is the reason why there is a lot of endothermus and hypoglobus. Now let's go back to the posterior medial bulge, which is this convex shape of the medial orbital wall and the orbital floor. You can see here, this is the originally inserted mesh, and this is the fracture line. If you compare this to the contralateral, the discrepancy and the dimension of bone loss and the loss of dimension in the orbit, and this posterior medial bulge here, this is one of the most important um, structures uh, that helps you to avoid um, endothymus and hypoglobus. Was this okay for understanding? Rudy, that was good actually for understanding. Uh, only thing is you might want to add that the green pointer that is visible there is part of your navigation unit because that exactly. is something which most people are not aware of. Please explain that also. Okay. Uh, and how it can be manipulated intra intraoperatively. I will, I will come to the topic navigation uh, within my next slides. But again, you can see uh, what uh, my colleague just told you, the green stick this is the pointer of the intraoperative real-time navigation, which gives you always in real time the option to see where you are with your pointer. And not only for dissecting the orbit, but also to check whether your implant is on the right position. And you can see that the green stick is on the violet line. This means there is the implant, there is my pointer. And this makes me uh, be very sure that my implant is the con correct position. And it's not only the position, you can also check the shape of the implant. So there are several options for that. Okay. And Rudy, now can, I, can, I just, can I just add, Rudy, for those who are using smartphones, you can actually pinch out the view. If you use your fingers, you can, you can uh, in, zoom. You can zoom, zoom uh, in to see more clearly. For the participants in Zoom, that is. I hope that is clear. Yeah. You can continue. Okay, so um, now let's talk about interpretive navigation. And there are three things you need. So two of them are um, essentially, and this is a 3D CT scan or CBCT scan with a high resolution. And when we talk about orbit, your resolution and your slice thickness should be very high and the slice thickness, thickness about one millimeter or less if possible. Then on the, second, on the second picture in the middle, you can see that you need a, a virtual preoperative plan. And this plan is, um, this plan is uh, uh, created by mirroring the contralateral unaffected side to the affected side and by mirroring, you can do a virtual reconstruction. And this virtual reconstruction, you can see in color, in yellow and in blue. This then can be later on followed by your interoperative pointer and navigation. And you can also print out your virtual plan and more or less bend your implant um, to your anatomical shape. If you have a patient-specific implant, which is the, the last picture on this um, slide, the yellow one, you also would need an STL file of this implant, which you can insert or include in your planning. And this helps you later on to see where your implant has to be. And this implant can be more or less followed with your interoperative navigation pointer to see whether it's in the, wrong, uh, whether it's in the correct position or not. First of all, before you start navigation, so you have your 3D image data set, you have your virtual plan with your uh, planning software, 
and sometimes you have your patient specific implant or you have your printed out model of the patient and you have bent a titanium mesh, for example. Then you have to register the patient in the operation room. So the CT scan on the platform has to be the reference to the skull of the patient. And we don't need to put the patient in the Mayfield clamp so it can be movable. But for this registration, you can choose four different options. First of all, you can define anatomical landmarks that help you later on uh, to reference your CT scan to your patient in the OR. Typical anatomical landmarks are the glabella, for example, the frontosychomatical suture, um, maybe molars or teeth, the nasal spine. So these are just, um, just anatomical landmarks you can easily find and you have to define them in your planning software first. The second option, which is a little bit more or much more precise is you can insert screws into the patient prior to a surgery and then scan the patients with a CT scan or a CBCT scan. And then you would have the screws in your CT and then you can reference those screws to a virtual plan. So this is a very precise. However, the patient needs a small surgery, maybe in local anesthesia, uh, where you can insert the screws or you can also use like um, screws that have already been inserted in, in uh, prior surgeries. What we prefer is uh, at the moment, um, the soft tissue navigation and referencing with the, um, uh, with the um, skin surface uh, testing, which is new. You can scan the skin and this is automatically referencing your laser adaptment. You can see this in the picture. This is like a laser scanner. And this automatically gives you a, a referencing to the patient, which is very fast, which is very efficient. And you don't have to use a second CD scan and you don't have to put in any screws. But again, you need a high resolution CT scan and you need your CT scan completely with the skin of the patient. So this is important because the skin of the patient in the CT scan is referenced to the laser pointer, which is more or less trying to follow the skin surface of your patient. It might be not very precise if the patient was swollen when the CT scan was taken and then you bring it to the arm maybe two or three days later and the swelling has to go down and then your navigation might not really be precise. So there are some things you have to take to, into consideration when you use the surface registration. For orbital surgery, we have developed the dental splint method, which is very easy. So you just use a normal splint, put in four uh, put in four um, like normal osteosynthesis screws. And this is a very precise uh, way. And then you put the patient again into the CT scan or the cone beam CT scan. And then again, you have the screw markers on your planning and you can try to reference this with your navigation platform. And you can see the discrepancy is only minus or plus 0.9 millimeters. So this is a very precise way of registration. However, your patient needs to have teeth. If the patient does not have teeth, you can use the other options. This is like uh, we do it. It's a conventional uh, normal splint. And we just put in a 2.0 osteosynthesis screws in four different angles and four different planes. And the patient then is scanned uh, together with the splint. And the splint has to be taken to surgery again and put into the patient's mouth. And then you can start the referencing in the OR. You can see uh, the CT scan here on the, on the right side of the picture, and you can see the four screws on the CT scan. And this then you can reference as your registration markers in your planning software. There are some other options. Once you have uh, registered your patient, you can also track instruments. So you can see on the left side, this is the calibration matrix where you can track any burr, any saw, piezoelectric instruments, so whatever you want, you can track it and put it in real time on your navigation system. And you always have the length of your burr and the di diameter of your burr, especially if you want to drill somewhere at the skull base or in an area where you don't uh, have a lot of uh, overview, you can use this technique to follow your drill in real time on your navigation. And in this time, uh, in this type of navigation, there's a special uh, thing you have to to know, and this is called trajectorial navigation. This is easy to explain. So in the planning software, you define a target. So this is the target where you want to go with your pointer or where you want to go with your drill 
or where you want to go with your bar. Then you also define an entry point where you want to start. So for example, at the infraorbital rim or at the lateral orbital suture or wherever. And then the, the software automatically draws a line, a straight line to the target. And this is more or less what you can see then on your navigation system. This is called the autopilot. And then you can follow with the pointer, this uh, trajectory line from the entry to the target. The navigation system tells you, you are right at the position where you have defined your target. And it also gives you some uh, deviations that you have to change the, uh, the way your, your pointer works. And this you can use for yeah, particular places that are hard to, to see during surgery, especially um, for example, the posterior shelf in the orbit, which is very far back in the orbit. And sometimes you will not be able to see it, and, but you can feel it with your pointer and you can see it by following your trajectory line. And then you know you are on the right position, you are on the posterior shelf of the orbit. So this is trajectory navigation. And um, I think this would be now the, uh, the chance for uh, the moderators to, to answer or to give some questions to the audience, or if the audience has any questions so far to navigation. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rudy. Thanks yeah. for uh, introducing the concept. Uh, now this is uh, this is still in its infancy in India, so the questions number of questions are limited to start with. But uh, let's start from the basics. Now uh, you have uh, put across very eloquently the uh, use of navigation for orbital surgery. Now the most basic question is, um, what is the difference uh, the, uh, of using navigation uh, between secondary surgery and primary surgery? Because the the case which you portrayed is actually a secondary surgery to start with. Uh, how would you rate using navigation for uh, primary versus secondary surgery? So um, I, I try to, um, I not correctly got your, your question. You, you wanted to ask what is the difference in primary and, and secondary or what are the indications? Yeah, yeah. The, with regard uh, to navigation. With regard to navigation. Use of navigation for yeah. primary surgery or delayed surgery, secondary surgery corrections. Is there a so, difference? It's the same or you're comfortable with it either way? So, um, so it, it's more or less the same. So the setup is the same. You have to do your referenciation, you have to have a CT scan, and then you have to go for the registration. You also need to have a plan, a virtual plan. The big now, when difference- you're at, uh, When you're looking at acute trauma setups, now let yeah. us say you have a panfacial trauma which has been wheeled in and uh, versus you showed a secondary uh, zygomatic orbital correction as your first uh, patient series. Yeah. Uh, you take time to develop these uh, treatment plans. So would you, you do you use navigation even for acute trauma settings or- Of course, you... yeah. Okay. So that of was-, that was yeah. Okay, I, I got your question. So um, both are the, the, the perfect indications for navigation because navigation is uh, radiation free it's always available and the plan if you are more or less skilled and using the software it's it's not it's not a big deal so mirroring and segmentation is a, a very fast uh, way you can also do this in the OR if you have intraoperative imaging you can just scan the patient first together with a scan reference array and then you would have a direct um, registration in the OR and then you can use in the OR the planning platform as well to do the segmentation the mirroring and this is a very precise one so okay. this works very fine in primary and secondary trauma. And um, you just need a little skill and training with the software and the equipment. The second this question to follow, follow this, Rudy, is uh, you were looking at uh, navigation. You're looking at planning using a mirroring image. So yeah. let us say you have a patient who's got bilateral involvement. You know, unilateral involvement, you can always mirror and use the contralateral side. Exactly. What happens in a bilateral case? So we have uh, developed some, uh, how can I say, some average skull. Uh, we uh, collected data sets of hundreds of patients. And uh, we have uh, a project together with our radiologist in Hanover that there is a software, but it takes a lot of time to calculate um, if you don't have the option to, to mirror. So there is um, an algorithm, there's a software available. We use this in rare cases. It takes one or two days of calculating but then you have more or less uh, using a lot of different CT scan 
for the patient uh, then to create a more or less average skull, but it's, the, it's better than having nothing at the moment. And this works pretty good, to be honest. But again, this is a lot of calculation necessary. And there's a lot of, uh, how can I say, a lot of uh, computer strengths you need, yeah? Um, so, uh, but does it does it mean that uh, when you're having a bilateral uh, procedure, you can actually make the calculations uh, using the algorithms you've already prepared, or uh, would you want to work on it uh, with every new patient? We can use the algorithms that are prepared, and we have for different patients, like from um, um, patients, um, sorry, from from children, from young adults, uh, and we have a lot of different skulls. And if we don't have the possibility to go for the huge um, for the, for the average skull, you can use uh, another patient's skull and just to, to uh, fuse the CT scans together and try to do a virtual reconstruction of the psychoma as well. And this is even better, even if it's not the original situation of the patient, it's even better having like a template like this than having nothing. And if you don't have this, we can also use just a normal average skull printed out for the OR, yeah, 3D model, something like this. like just a normal skull of the patient. And then you can use something like this to prevent titanium implants, plates and meshes. And this is even better than having nothing. So you can use this sterile in the OR as I would say the cheapest way of uh, individualization of, of medicine if you don't have all the other options. And the results are pretty good. So you don't really see a big difference between, between this and um, how can I say, the uh, calculated skull of hundreds of hundreds of CT scans. But still, yeah, this brings us to a problem if both sides are affected. Yes, Kanan. But no, just as a take, um, let's be honest, we all are not going to get navigation tomorrow, right away. So what I was asking is, as a, as a counter effect to improve these skills, what we do a little bit more of pre-surgical planning, halfway house, you know what I mean, do a Mirror the same way as you said, mirror it on your pre-surgical planning with your software and maybe yeah. print a skull with the mirrored image, with the reconstructed yeah. image. On that adapter mesh, so you have a, you have done both of what you're doing. Of course, you can't yeah. position it exactly where you want to do, but it is, don't you think it will be better? And if you have a C-arm which can get your orbital, this thing, you are getting somewhere there. Would you Definitely. advocate something like that? Yeah, absolutely. So if you have the chance to do this, if you can uh, print out biomodels of the patients with the mirrored reconstruction, this is almost close to perfect. So this is the, the best you can do. And again, navigation is something nice to have. And uh, it, it's not, uh, how can I say, it's not required uh, all the time and you don't need to do it. And to be honest, if you would have the chance to decide whether you would use intraoperative imaging or navigation, I would now go for intraoperative imaging. So navigation is, is nice to have, but again, it's not essential. And if you have uh, the way you described of printing out the patient, bending the plates, it's almost close to perfect. And I will show you later a study, uh, the orbital study we did with the AO. And there we could clearly show that our way of doing this and which is done all over the world by just bending the plates, you have almost perfect results. So, so this is excellent. If you can do this, this yes. is really the best way. So could you just to elaborate for our sake, the actual difference between intraoperative navigation and intraoperative imaging? The, the difference? difference between the two. Okay, so um, if you, for example, um, use uh, intraoperative CT arm, uh, C arm, you can also uh, fuse your data, I will show this later, with your preoperative virtual plan, but you don't need the navigation. And if you have intraoperatively your CT scan and you fuse it with the plan, you can perfectly see if you are in the right position or not. With the navigation, you don't see the bone you have reduced, you only see uh, if your pointer is maybe on uh, the bone you have virtually put in another position. So there is, you don't really see what you have reconstructed. You can only follow your plan. And again, you still have a little deviation of your pointer, which is only a few millimeters, but it can be 
uh, two or three or four millimeters if you have only the, the soft tissue navigation. Um, and so intraoperative imaging give, gives you the real result and you can mirror, uh, you can fuse this with your virtual plan and then you can see perfectly, have you reached your goal or not? And with navigation, without imaging, you only see your pointer at your virtually um, corrected bone, but you don't see your virtually corrected bone on the navigation system. You know what I mean? Rudy, uh, can, I, can I make a small uh, comment here to explain it better? And let's take the analogy of a, of a car using a uh, GPS, okay? Yeah. Now, uh, let us say uh, I'm monitoring from my screen or uh, the uh, control room. I'm able to monitor the movement of the car on my screen. Yeah. Okay, this is for all the uh, audience. Uh, the screen that I see on which the car is virtually moving is navigation. Okay, I can see it move on the map. That is navigation. I don't yeah. know whether the car has actually reached. I can only see the sensor move. Okay. While if you if you're looking at intraoperative imaging, I have a person standing at that particular point who's taking a video camera video uh, live and then transmitting the image to me, which means he's showing the car in the right place. That's the difference. One is exactly. seeing screen where I'm only able to see the virtual image of the car moving on the map. Yeah. So I know he's reached, uh, let's say Hanover, but I don't know whether he's actually reached Hanover until Rudy takes a picture and sends it back to me. Absolutely true. Perfect description. So, so would you always <laughs> finish up with an intraop CT even after navigation? Um, so always together or? No, so after maybe... navigation to confirm, would you do an intraop CT or a post-op CT? Um, if you have, the, uh, we, we do this just uh, a lot of for, for research reasons, but yes, we, we do this. If we use navigation, we again check this with interoperative imaging. Okay. Yeah. For is, the is orbit. That... This is double. I know this. This is uh, maybe too much, <laughs> but it, it, if, if you have the chance to play around, you can see, can you trust your navigation or do you need the CT, uh, to the CR? Yeah, this, this is true. But sometimes if we don't have the virtual planning, then we go more or less now we have switched to use more the, the C arm than the navigation, or especially or in, in normal trauma cases like psychometric fractures, we don't use the, the navigation anymore. We just spin around with the C arm and that's it. But for orbit, we use both and I will explain why. Is there an age contraindication for interoperative CT? like so under seven year olds or something like that, or no, um, for, especially have, the intraop ones? No, no I, don't, I don't think so. So not in Germany. So this just yeah, depend, yeah, yeah. depends on what you, what you think is the correct indication for using it. Um, for younger patients, we are, of course, um, trying not to use too many CT scans. So we would not scan such a patient again for using navigation, again, post-operatively. So in, in younger patients, we try to reduce it. But intraoperatively, we don't have a CT. We have a CBCT scan, which has a little less uh, radiation exposure than a CT scan. Yeah. But again, if we talk about the orbit, even in children, we would go for a post-operative image, 3D, because we want to see whether your implant is in the right position. And if it's not at the right position, you can use, you can cause harm to the orbit. And that's why I think the post-operative imaging three-dimensionally in the orbit is at the moment, I would consider it a must if you have it available. Because you have to prove that you have been there and that your implant is at the correct position and that there's no entrapment of soft tissues and that there's no um, implant parts uh, pointing into the orbit or entrapping muscles. And to be honest, if you don't have patient-specific implants and, and if you use the meshes, the meshes are still formable. You can still, they're still changing shape if you are not very uh, gentle. And the, the hand-banded titanium meshes, with, with that, I, I will show you some pictures. We can cause still a lot of damage to the orbit because they change their shape during insertion if you are not careful. So especially if you use those meshes, hand band mesh, tight, normal titanium mesh, then I would definitely go for post-operative CT scan. And if you would have done this in the case I showed you, the secondary one, you could have seen that your implant is completely at the wrong position, totally at the wrong position. 
And this is something you cannot see always intraoperatively if you are not experienced to go along in the orbit very, very, uh, very well. And this maybe would have uh, saved for the patients I showed you a secondary correction. If you would have done a post-operative or intraoperative scan, you could have seen that your implant is completely in the maxillary sinus and it's not an adequate orbital reconstruction. And by what we know today, this is pretty sure that those patients will end up having endosamos and hypoglobus. Okay, but okay. Um, I, I think a lot of these questions which um, uh, arise now, I will answer or will be answered in the, in the further slides. Yeah, yeah, that's better. We, before we, we move on again, Rudy, Praveen, just, we just have a complimentary music to play, which is going to precede the rest. So just for 30 seconds, be ready, you'll hear an audio, and then at the end of the music, you can start again. Okay. Okay. Go yeah, ahead, try to get... So the music is now starting. It should now. Praveen, you're ready? I cannot hear. Yeah. No, we can't hear the music, Praveen. I think if no, we can move on. Don't worry, I think there might be an issue. So we'll move on, we'll look at the next break. Please, uh, please proceed. Okay, um, the question now is, uh, I showed you the concept of trajectorial navigation so that you have a straight line that you can follow with your navigation pointer. So what are the indications for that? So we use navigation, um, as I said, for trauma, for tumor, for biopsies. And this is a good example for the trajectorial navigation. So um, we used to uh, do in a few cases like the psycho psychoma implants, if there is no way of bony augmentation and um, inserting a psychoma implant is the best way of describing trajectorial navigation. So you have a point of entry where your psychoma implant inserts the bone and you have a target where you want to have the end of the, psy of the psychomatic implant that it, for example, should not be in the orbit, that it should not be too far out of the zygoma. So this is the perfect way of describing trajectorial navigation. And the question is, again, why would we use navigation in orbital surgery? And I will try to explain that. But first, before we go to this topic, I want to ask you, what should be your goals of reconstruction in the orbit? And this has been shown very clearly by our publication. So the goal of orbital reconstruction at the end, so when you leave the OR, you should have re-established the volume of the orbit, but you cannot see volume as a parameter in, this, in surgery. So how can you measure volume? Intraoperatively, it's not possible. You can measure it later on on your CT scan. And you should also be able to more or less have reconstructed the shape of the orbit uh, as close to the original as possible. So this should be the goal so the same volume, re-establishing volume and shape. And both parameters are very important for later, uh, uh, for later development of anophthalmos and hypoglobus. <laughs> However, if you have secondary corrections, and this is the problem because there's soft tissue scarring, there is fat atrophy in the orbit, there is scarring and all this stuff, this might or is really hard to predict. And in that case, or in those cases, secondary corrections sometimes, or most of the time, to be honest, a little overcorrection is required. But this is something you cannot really, uh, how can I say, predict prior to surgery. It's like a feeling how much you have to forward or put up the infraorbital rim or the orbital floor that the eye comes forward one or two millimeters. So there is no direct correlation. And this is the problem. So that means re-establishing volume and shape even in secondary reconstruction is a good basis for you to start. And if still the patient is looking anophthalmic and hypoglobic, you have more options to correct this. And you have then the possibility to use, for example, Carvalho split bone grafts intraoperatively to then try to really yeah. adjust the globe to a better position. But this is just done by, by this. So you, you cannot really see the volume in the OR, you can see shape of your original reconstruction. 
But again, you don't know exactly the way there's no direct correlation between volume and uh, sagittal and vertical globe position. And this is just like a feeling. And if you, uh, you have con uh, reconstructed your orbit true to original in terms of volume and shape, and there's still the globe is not in the correct position, then you can go for harvesting split grafts, calvary split bone grafts, and adjust the globe clinically. So these are the big difference between primary and secondary bony reconstructions of the orbit. In the end, the globe should be at the correct position compared to the contralateral <coughs> side. This is the final aim. So this is just uh, maybe for you a very simple uh, um, um, orbital fracture, but you can see she has anophthalmos. And as you can see in her, in this patient, she has a lot of tattoos. She takes a lot of care about her uh, looking. She has a lot of, um, how can I say, she's, she's taking herself in the mirror every 10 seconds. And she was really disturbed by this right side anophthalmos. Some people not even might have noticed it. If you take a look at the CT scan, first of all, it's very important to adjust your CT scan to your plane. So you should be able to judge if the zygoma is in the right position, if your frontal base is parallel to your screen, and if you have the sagittal plane um, adjusted to the Frankfurt horizontal plane. So when I look at the CT scan, no matter if it's a zygomatic fracture, if it's an orbital fracture, adjustment of the CT scan is very important because if you have the combination with the zygomatic fracture, if you correct only uh, the, the orbital fracture, it, you can end up having exophthalmos because your zygoma is in the wrong position. So this is very important, judging and um, having a great, a good look at your outer bony frame. And if this is correct, you can address your orbital reconstruction. Otherwise you might end up having a, a, a totally dis disturbed globe. Again, there's something we have to take into consideration. The orbit is angulated in the skull by about 45 degrees. So if you want to take a look at the cause of the orbital floor at the cause of the medial wall, we have to change our plane of view in the CT scan to see the whole dimension in the sagittal plane of your fracture. And this is what we call an oblique sagittal plane and you should be able in your CT viewer in your diacom viewer at your hospital or your private practice to adjust your way of looking at CT scan individually. And if you are able to change your plane in sagittal view, like to a 45 degree angle, you can see on the left side, the complete dimension of the fracture starting directly after the post-entry zone on the orbit, but going back completely to the posterior shelf. So this is almost a total loss of your orbital floor. And you might not be able to see this if you are not able to adjust, uh, adjust your CT scan to the orbital anatomy. And this is very important to know. If you go there with a straight plane, you will never be able to see the orbital floor in its complete dimensions at one look. And you always have to compare left side with right side to see how the shape of the orbital floor is originally. And this is, for example, the plane, the oblique sagittal plane. Try to put your viewer in like an adjustment that the line goes through the uh, optic canal and the infraorbital uh, foramen. And take a look in this plane at your orbit and you can see the whole dimensions of your fracture. Radiologists are not able to look at an orbit like this. They don't know that. So that's important for you. You will have to uh, educate the radiologists because they would just give you axial view, sagittal view, coronal view. But for analysis of orbital fractures, playing around with your planes of view is the most important thing in getting the right and correct diagnosis. Take a look at the coronal view. You can see this is just a mild minor orbital floor fracture. So no one would treat it if you would just take a look at the coronal view. If you take a look at the actual view, you can see, <coughs> excuse me, that the posterior medial bulge, so in the, in the posterior part of the orbit is fractured. Compare this please to the other side of the orbit and you can see the dimension of loss of bone and this caused the end of in that patient. 
And you would not have been able to see this if you just look at reformatted CT scans, which will be provided by your radiologist. And if you take a look at the oblique sagittal view, you can also see that almost the complete orbital floor has gone almost until the posterior shelf. And these two things, axial view in this patient and the oblique sagittal view were the indications for treating that. The coronal view only was a minor displacement orbital fracture and a little uh, drop of fat hanging out would not be maybe the indication for going for orbital surgery. I think um, this is, can be understood by everyone. This, this example shall really show you how important it is to look at your CT scan in all three different planes and try to find an oblique sagittal view for the, the orbital floor and have a very good look at the posterior medial bulge. And I will show you a picture of that later on. When we do the virtual planning preoperatively, we have developed a way of reconstructing the orbit according to the key areas I just mentioned. We try to do it true to original, but we know it's not true to original, it's mirrored. So it's not the original orbit we reconstruct, we use the mirrored image of the contralateral side to have a more or less a fitting a template, but still this is not a problem so far. So the, 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 the variations you have between mirroring and original orbital shape are not as strong that you would see a difference in the patient's later uh, final result. So segmenting the orbit, mirror it to the contralateral side, and then you can see clearly the difference in color where your orbital floor fracture is. And now let's go for the key areas, which we always consider in diagnostic and later implant shape and design. So first of all, we have a lazy S shape. The orbital floor is not straight. It's like an S and it's like a lazy S. And this lazy S shape is important for the position of the globe in the sagittal plane as well. So anothermos or exothermos. We have the post-entry zone, which is the biggest opening of the orbit. I would just try to explain. So the post-entry zone is this zone behind the infraorbital rim. And there you can see this is the biggest dimension of the orbit. It's not here. The biggest dimension is a little bit, one centimeter maybe into the orbit. If you don't consider the post-entry zone and just put an implant from the infraorbital rim in this position to the posterior ledge, you could also end up having hypoglobus. So the eyeball is too high. So the post-entry zone is very important to take into consideration. The S shape like this, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but this S shape is very important. And again, the posterior shelf or posterior ledge, which is part of the maxillary bone. So it's not orbital bone, it's maxillary bone of the pterygoid uh, maxillary bone. And on top of this posterior shelf, your implant should lie later on. Let's go to the coronal flu. In the coronal flu, we have a, another very important key area, and this is called the transition zone. So what do we mean by a transition zone? It's a transition between medial orbital wall and floor. And this is also very important if you uh, do your diagnosis on the CT scan. So this thing here in the orbit is also considered to be a buttress, like the zygomatical maxillary buttress or like the um, zygomatic arch. And for the orbit, this transition zone, it's a very stable bone. And this is not fractured frequently, only in very heavy trauma. And usually it's, it's not fractured. So this gives you a good pillar. This is a, a very stable um, buttress in the orbit. And you can use this as a, a, a buttress for your reconstruction. And the angle between medial wall and floor, I'll show you again, there's an angle here. You can see that the angle is bigger with the fracture and the angle gets smaller if you do the reconstruction and you use always the contralateral side, as you can see here, as a template. So the position of the transition zone here should be the same here in fracture and the angle between medial wall and floor should also be the same here. That means the fracture of my orbit is not only here, it's also fractured here. That means in your reconstruction, at least 
a little bit of your transition zone, a little bit of this ankle has to be included in your implant, has to be included in your reconstruction. This is an important point. So let me give you another very important um, landmark for maybe finding out whether this patient develops endosalmus or hyperglobus. If you take a look of the inferior rectus muscles here, so the periorbit is intact. It's not fractured, and you can see it's like a lens. So in the intact orbit, you have lens-shaped muscles. In a fractured orbit, especially if the periorbital uh, septum is opened, you can see that the muscle changes shape. It's not lens shape anymore, like here, it's round. And if it's a round muscle, you know the periorbit is opened up. And a periorbit that is opened up is a good indicator for you to see the, the severity of trauma and the severity of damage to the soft tissues in the orbit. And this is for us also maybe an indication to go for an orbital reconstruction because after that, the orbit will scar. The, the microarchitecture of the orbital soft tissue, like the corneas, uh, um, the corneas um, fibers are damaged. Um, so this, this gives you a very good indication that there is soft tissue trauma to the orbit, not only bony trauma. So always try to see the difference between the muscles. And if the muscle is round, you know periorbit is open. You know the microarchitecture of the fat in the orbit, the corneas uh, um, fibers are damaged. And this gives you a good, maybe a good probability of, of the patient ending up with anophthalmos and hypoglobus. Okay, so these are the key areas. If the key areas are fractured, this is for us the indication to go for orbital reconstruction. And the key areas should be part of your reconstruction as well. So the shape of your implant should be able to restore those fractured key areas. And then your probability of having anosamus and hypoglobus gets reduced or is minimal. This is what I mentioned several times, the posterior medial bulge. Please have a look at the convex shape of the medial orbital wall towards the posterior third of the orbit. And please have a look at the fractured side and you see the loss of dimension here. And you see this amount of bone or dimension is missing. And the posterior middle bulge here, this is a very, very important structure anatomically um, that gives you also a good idea whether to operate or not, because those patients are very likely to end up having anosalms. And if I go back again, only showing you this picture together with the, 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 the damaged uh, muscle or the, the periorbital soft tissues, this would be hard to say whether you go for a surgery or not. But if you take a look at the sagittal plane, take a look at all your key areas, Take a look at the key areas here and the muscle shape. Take a look at the key areas here. And this weather as a package gives you the explanation why this patient has anosalmus. Are there so far any questions from the audience concerning key areas for reconstruction and diagnosis? Shall I continue? Um Trudy, probably you can continue because we will have all the questions at the end at the end of the orbit session because most of them will come back to the same thing, isn't it? Okay, so after we have put a, a correct diagnosis, which is important, you need to have the correct diagnosis in order to make a correct treatment. Now we know that there's a, a lot of different implants available, but which implant fits the best on your defect? And there's the, the big question between just bending meshes intraoperatively without any planning, without any biomodels, um, really individual orbital implants or like standard of the shelf orbital implants, the preformed ones. We know that if you have the wrong size of your implant and remember please the picture I showed you at the very beginning. So the implant was designed too short. It did not fit to the posterior shelf and the wrong position of the implant. So it doesn't always be uh, if you have the correct size, but if you put it on the wrong position, 
you will also end up having those problems like displacement of the implant into the maxillary sinus, maybe diplopia because of entrapment of soft tissues, pseudoptosis or even deepening of the supratarsal fold, which is a good sign of anosamus. So not only the correct size, but also the correct position of the implant are mandatory to achieve an adequate reconstruction. So this, to be honest, autologous bone is always the best in terms of biologically adequate reconstruction, but you can know that this bone resorbs sometimes. You also have to make up a second incision to harvest the, um, the Calvaria split bone grafts, but from a biological point of view, this would be a very good reconstruction. But as you can see, it's very hard to shape those bone grafts according to the very complex shape of the orbit. But still, if you are able to do this, if you know how to, to um, insert and plan the surgery in, pay, on, in people who, who are trained to do like this, they also achieve a very good result, especially Beatama, I will mention him later on. He is doing almost exclusively autologous bone reconstruction of the orbit. And the pioneers of orbital reconstruction, they also started by using those bone graphs. And this is Paul Manson. And if you take a look at the year, so it's 1987. And Paul Manson is a very important um, guy in the AO. He was one of the first who, who really described orbital deformities after trauma. He was one of the first who identified or defined what is a nano E fracture. So before that, it was what not even uh, considered or known. And he could find out with the study that, as I already mentioned, post-traumatic anathermos is a very important orbital post-traumatic deformity. And this is caused because the shape of the orbit and the volume have changed. So this is his paper. It's like a milestone of orbital surgery. And there's another very important uh, colleague, Joe Grass. Unfortunately, I think he died last year. And uh, he was one of the first who uh, described the bony reconstruction of the orbit. And you can see in his drawing that he also took into consideration to reconstruct the medial wall and floor and to do this uh, with autologous bone. But you can see this is a very technically demanding um, procedure. It's not very predictive if you do it for the first time. There's a lot of experience uh, uh, required for that. And you always have to do like a secondary incision to get the bone grafted harvest, harvested. And it's very hard to shape those bone crafts according to the complex shape that we had shown. And if you take a look now, because you are um, experts now in, in analyzing orbital fractures and you can see the coronal scan, you would now see the transition zone has not been reconstructed, which should be here. The, the bone graft is completely at the wrong position. And there's also an undetected medial orbital wall fractures. But again, these were the beginnings of surgery. And today, this would be tried to make better by reconstructing the transition zone between medial wall and floor. So this is something you will end up having when you start trying to use autologous bone graft for the first time. And as you can see, it's not easy to put them at the correct position. And it's also not easy to put them in the correct shape. And um, what Joe Grass and Paul Manson found out in their studies, and what now is, I think, known to everyone in the community, that there's a discrepancy between the volume and the shape. And this end up having anophthalmos and hypoglobus. But you have to consider that there are also additional causes that uh, might explain anophthalmos and hypoglobus. And this is, uh, this is the also mentioned, very frequently mentioned atrophy of the intra and extra colon fat. Please remember the shape of the inferior rectus muscle I showed you. And the other lid retraction and entrapment. So soft tissue reasons might also explain later on if you have reconstructed the orbit, why you can still have um, some anophthalmos and hypoglobus. And this is particularly uh, important in secondary reconstructions because in those cases, most of the time you already have some soft tissue problems left. But again, taking all these uh, publications together and bringing it in, the, uh, in, in our actual time, 
So what those guys found out is it's very important that you use a dimensionally stable reconstruction. So nothing that resorbs, nothing that goes away because the definition of a reconstruction is that it stays. It's not good if your reconstruction goes away. And uh, most uh, orbital fractures, we don't call them fractures, we call them defects because you know that the bone is most of the time gone. It's like exploded and you will not be able to put all these small pieces of bone of the orbital floor together and to do a reduction and a fixation. So that's why we call this reconstruction rather than reduction of fracture and stabilization. And that again needs for you to be uh, your reconstruction stable and not something that resorbs and goes away because if your reconstruction goes away, the position of the globe changes. And this is Ed Ellis, I think everybody knows him. And uh, he did a good study and compared all the different uh, options we have for orbital reconstructions. And he, he found it out um, almost 20 years ago that titanium mesh is more or less his first choice for internal orbital reconstruction because compared to all these other ones, you can see that you have some problems with shaping and contouring it. You have problems with stiffness. You have volumes that don't maintain their volume. And you also have the donor side mobility and the titanium mesh so far. And now the 3D printed titanium implants are from what we know, the most adequate implants without donor side mobility, without a resorption, with a good stiffness and a high biologically adequate um, biology. If you take a look at this paper and uh, I, I really like to, to cite this and because there's also a very nice comment of Ed Ellis, you can see this group, um, they did a reconstruction of the orbit and um, I have to just give me a second to see what I'm telling you. Um, this is what they have considered to be their reconstruction. And now again, trying to, to imagine what we have talked about prior to the shape of the orbit, you can see that this autologous uh, temporalis fascia grafting for the orbit did not end up in having a dimensionally stable orbit. And Ed Ellis commented on that and said that he would have come to the complete opposite uh, explanation because um, you can see that this reconstruction did not follow the original plan and was not able to reconstruct the key areas. And um, so this is what we consider an in, not a dimensionally stable reconstruction and those patients are very likely to end up having Exof uh, endothermus and hypoglobus. In these defects, something that goes away, like PDS sheets, like temporalis fascia grafting, so whatever material uses that goes away and is not able to keep your reconstruction is in that fracture uh, not adequate. This is just uh, for you to give you an overview about different implants. Um, on the left side, you can see the non-preformed standard titanium meshes of the shelf and Rudy, uh, can yeah? i just interrupt you uh, for the benefit of the audience uh, there are a number of questions uh, which have been asked uh, in the last 10 minutes on the clarity for the posterior medial bulge which you uh, which you have very uh, beautifully explained uh, i i would be very uh, happy if you're able to demonstrate it with two photographs one of your own uh, uh, computer assisted planning where you've shown the uh, necessity for the posterior medial bulge to be yeah. reconstructed and second uh, Anthony Shine and uh, Gruss's uh, paper where despite their bony correction they have not been able to achieve the posterior medial bulge I think these are two important photographs that would elicit uh, what is the beauty of the transition zone and the uh, posterior medial bulge can you please uh, redo that again for the benefit of the audience Okay, um, yeah. I, think, I hope yeah. I... Uh, Rudy, subsequently you're coming up with placing the mesh in a... Exactly, this would make skull. them understand it better. Skull, so maybe if you swing there... And okay, then ah, how you place I, I the understand. Mesh. So, okay. Yeah. More, more, more than the CT image, uh, subsequently you'll have some images placing the mesh with the, on a skull pre-contouring and that I think probably 
we are being bombarded with questions about the medial bulge how you are positioning limit of posterior dissection how you are ascertaining <laughs> yeah this 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 is not easy um yeah um uh, i can't see all the videos just uh, I'm a little bit struggling well, if you, with, if, you, with... if you can scroll down after your implants where you are four five slides down I think you might this no, no come below come below below again I yeah. have not shown this so far no no yeah so somewhat but then they are asking this with regard to navigation navigation that is better yeah uh, rudy your uh, your image originally was good you know the one which you selected yeah that's the one yeah uh, please take this them is the bulge the, yeah this is the, the contrast for this one and the previous the uh, coronal section also please yeah yeah after you demonstrate the uh, the medial uh, transition zone here please take them through the uh, to the photograph uh, of gruss's uh, publication joseph gruss's publication which shows the bone graft not seated in the right seated place there. that will show them what is the transition zone and then you can give, maybe give your explanation it will be great okay um so for, first of all um i i can't see myself the video it's not you can you can go to the corner and swap ah i know i got it i got it okay so mm, i think i have a better picture uh, just a second here so i try to zoom so the posterior medial bulge is this area here between the medial orbital wall and the floor in the posterior part of the orbit and if you take a look at um, um, a model maybe you have in your uh, in your office you can also you can really feel that this bulge is uh, like an uh, like um convex convex towards convex the sorry yes convex pointing into the orbit and um you can only see this if you take a very close look at your uh, ct scans let's go back let's show this maybe you can see all together this is a posterior medial bulge in the actual view and you see the loss of um, dimension here if you take a look at this shape this is the correct side this is not fractured and if you compare this to this side you can see the loss of this convexity in this picture it's not very uh, not very strong but i can maybe show later on which uh, a better one and uh, this is the posterior rudy, medial i'm sorry rudy yeah? rudy sorry i think our screens are stuck pravin we are still with the geographers article screen we are not seeing what you are seeing ah i'm sorry yeah our screen is showing the annals of plastic surgery with joke this is undirected medial wall and now did you see that no can you see the oblique sagittal view here no not yet not yet no, no. i think our screen is frozen ah okay ah, i get it uh, uh, he, he need to release the screen yeah now it can uh, yeah yeah okay yeah. yeah now we can ah, see ah that's fine this this is a great pic yeah sorry if you can no. go through again sorry about that okay so you haven't seen this here what i was showing so this is the posterior medial bulge it's between the medial orbital wall and the floor in the posterior third and if you feel this on the um, bio model or uh, artificial skull you might have in your uh, office that this is like an um uh, sorry <laughs> like an uh, uh, yeah it's pointing into the orbit convex like a sorry like a convexity pointing into the orbit and this is uh, one of the key areas which is very important for um getting anophthalmos for not getting anophthalmos in hypoglobus and i will show you this at the ct scan again here and in this picture you can see uh, the right side of the orbit which is fractured and the left side which is not fractured and you can see the convex shape i will show you again of the posterior medial bulge here in the posterior third of the orbit and on the other side you see it's only until here but a big part of it is missing and you can see the dislocated bone into the inner e complex 
And this loss of dimension explains anothamus. So now let's go for the transition zone here. It's not, it's not a very clear picture, but I wanted to show you this case because there uh, might be people who said, this is something we, you don't need to treat, but you can only see really if you want to treat it by looking at all different CT scans, uh, uh, slices. And now let's go back to the paper from uh, Joe Grass. Um, maybe I'll make it like this. Yeah. Okay, As this you're is searching the pa paper, Rudy. There's a is, question which says, is there a measurement for that angle? Um, when we, you said we, the posterior medial bulge, the medial wall to the floor, is there a standard measurement for the angle or? It's always the contralateral orbit. You compare it with, but is there a 40 yes. degree? Has it been measured or have you guys looked into it when you're doing like it is 45 yeah. degrees or 60 yes. degrees or something um, like that? We, we, we have, uh, there is um, a PhD thesis going on at the moment where um, a student is analyzing, analyzing uh, the angles yes. between medial wall and floor, but uh, this is not, not so far uh, published, but we were looking at this. But again, for the individual reconstruction, the contralateral side still gives the best template. If you are not able to virtually reconstruct the orbit by, um, by itself, the mirroring of the contralateral side gives you the best idea. And if you take the transition zone of the healthy side and mirror it to the contralateral side, then you have a very good, a very precise, almost very true to original reconstruction of, of this, this angle between wall and floor. Okay, um, again, this is the transition zone here. And this is a reconstruction with autologous bone. You can see this is the bone here, which is in the, the maxillary sinus. This is the fractured orbital floor. And you can see that the fracture is not only here, but it's also here in the transition zone. So it should be placed somewhere like here, yeah? But the transition zone is fractured. That's wonderful, like Rudy. That, that is what they wanted. That's beautiful. Yeah. And you can see that this should be like this. Exactly. Okay. And this is really tricky to do with autologous bone grafts. Really tricky. You can do this, but it's tricky. Still, autologous bone is a perfect option. But at the moment, we are not able to put autologous bone in such a perfect uh, shape like uh, titanium meshes, which are printed. Um, okay, uh, this, so the fracture is not only here, as I said, it's also here in the transition zone. And the newly reconstructed trans transition zone is here and the contralateral one is here. Yeah, and by just mirroring the orbit, you would have much better position. Yeah, I know it's a mirror image and it's not the original image, but again, it's the best option at the moment you have and that is easily available by just mirroring it. Yeah, and just a sec, Rudy, is there a specific uh, reference point for CTs would you use? Because you need these images for either navigation or assessing. Yeah. Do you ask the radiologist for a specific method of doing CT or you just say CT, facial cuts? We want because the is CT that an scan? angulation? Yeah, no, the CT no. scan, do you tell them it has to be neutral, yeah. not neutral or something like yes. that? Neutral CT scan, no gantry or gantry zero, one millimeter slice thickness, and we only need a surgeon, the original data set, the actual one. All the other reformatation, they can throw it into their waste in the bin. You can do this by yourself while with your uh, viewer. So the basic data set, actual view, one millimeter slice thickness, DICOM data, um, gantry zero, and then you can play with it. You don't need those things done by the radiologist. Yes, yeah. What, what software would you use? To your, what software do you use or what software do you think is uh, better? You need- For, for the DICOM a, software, something like so Osirix. The, the DICOM okay. software should be able. So we have one which is called Visage. It's a very expensive server-based software, which is very good. And we use co-diagnostics, which is now transformed to Strawman for dental implants. But again, no matter what software you use, do you should just to be able to, to do something like this, to is play around, something, something free to software? play around with your planes. You have to be able to play around with your planes. This is what your software should be able to. 
like this. Yeah, you should yeah. be able to put your software, the plane of view, in this yellow plane, just playing around. I think normal DICOM PAX viewers, they are not able to change planes. And there's a lot of freeware available for this. I think Osirix, I don't know. Uh, maybe it's possible to, to go there, but uh, this is the only recommendation we have. You should be able to change the planes by yourself. The, the other question which asked is when you're mentioning orient the angle in the sagittal plane. So how do you orient it? Is it, is it in the software or DICOM viewer? And how do you orient it? That's the question which has come up. When you said Again, to look please. at the laziest Again. curve uh, in the sagittal plane, you said yeah. to orient it. Yeah. So how do you orient it? Or I try to put the plane from the infraorbital for Raymond. As you can see here, this is the black line, the angled, and it, it, uh, through the optical canal. So this should be in your CT scan. So turn around your CT scan until you see in your plane of your monitor, you can see the infraorbital foramen on one side and on the other side, the optical canal. Uh, Rudy, can I, can I break you are, in between for a moment? Like this. Uh, this is the orientation you should have. Excuse me, Rudy, can I break, you yeah. break in for yes. a moment? Uh, yes. Kanan, this is just as a clarification. See, the reason why Rudy is not able to understand your question for change of angulation or plane is because he's using much more advanced softwares where he yeah. can actually yeah. tilt the plane and create planes. Yeah. We yes. don't have access to that. We don't have, correct. The yeah. simple method that uh, we can use to understand this is uh, when you're looking at a CBCT uh, uh, software for view of dental implants. Exactly. You have a tomogram yes. view. You know, in that you can change yeah. planes. So if you are able to have a software which is similar to that, you'll be able to change planes, change which planes. currently none of the freewares offer. But, but still, I think there is freeware available. Okay, and, that, um, that'll be great, Rudy. If you're able to send us uh, some information on that, it will be wonderful. Thank you. Okay. Um, maybe I have, um, yeah, I, I, will send, I will send you this. And uh, Osirix is from Apple. I think everyone knows it. A lot of people yeah. are using it. I'm not sure, but I can imagine that it's possible to change the planes. And a lot of um, CT scans or CBCT scans, which are printed onto um, a CD from your dental radiologist or whatever, uh, a lot of these softwares are also able to play with the planes. And you can maybe use the software, which is sometimes freeware, um, to import your DICOM data and then just try to play around a little bit. Yeah, I but think we yes, should try using the dental the software. software. Dental. Yes, with the dental software, it should be most of the time able and I think there is freeware around and you don't need that very sophisticated um, software because we only use it for this purpose. That would be, so it's, it's a platform from our hospital, we can use it and that's why uh, it's, it's okay for us but otherwise it's a very, very uh, cheap, a very expensive um, um, abo, yeah. Okay, but maybe I will find the slide better slides later. Okay, so if you are happy, I can. Yeah, let's move. Let's Thanks, move. Yeah. We have talked about the different materials. And we started now with the different implants. The problem is that the terminology, so the wording is, uh, is very difficult because everybody calls it differently. And this is very hard to, to really differentiate. Most importantly, so a patient specific implant, a real patient specific implant is printed or is milled according to a virtual plan. Anything else is either preformed, standard preformed, preformed on, on any kind of bio model, but you would not call this patient specific or customized implant. So if it's customized or if it's patient-specific, it's coming out of a 3D printer. It's not modified by bending by hand or it's milled out of a block of metal, titanium or whatever. All the other things are, and we try to put a little order and to, to make this a little bit more clear, non-preformed meshes is just something plain, the standard titanium mesh off the shelf. This is non-preformed. 
And the standard preformed titanium implants you can see here, this is from Sintis. Um, they have already changed the shape a little bit. They have already tried to put in some information of uh, average shape of orbital floor, medial wall, and the dimension. So this is a standard on one side, but it's already a little bit preformed. And the, the end of the evolution is the real patient specific one. The two non-preformed and standard preformed meshes you can preform and bend when you use the biomodel of the patient. That makes them like individualized meshes based on the virtual planning, yeah? And you print out your plan and then you bend the implant. With this technique, you can get them close to patient specific, but they are not patient specific, they are individualized. If you just use the mesh in the OR and bend it by your hand, like, like you, uh, your experience, then it's just a non-preformed or just a standard preformed mesh. And um, this is an average uh, style model. We are not able to use this anymore because uh, of our sterilization process. They don't want to use this. They, want, they don't want us to use this anymore. But this, if you don't have any planning, if you don't have any printer, such a model gives you a very good help in, uh, in designing such an orbital implant. And you can see the shape, the reconstruction of medial wall and floor. You can see the posterior bulge, which is covered. And you can see that the mesh is overbent. So like this, it's overbent in the posterior part to sit on top of the posterior shelf and not to point into the orbit. That's why the bending at the end in the middle picture has to go down on the back. And this is what we call inverted snow shovel. Yeah, if you take a snow shovel in the winter and put away the snow and you put the, the shovel around, then it's inverted snow shovel. Yeah? And this should be the design in the posterior part of the orbit that you don't harm the uh, optical nerve and you don't harm any soft tissues back there. And if you are good at this, you don't need a biomodel printed out. You can have a very good and a very nice shape of your implant. But just using an average skull, like, like something you, you can buy wherever. Yeah. So this is, if you have nothing, just take this. And this is better. This is a really good option easy and good option. And you can see that you can do a lot of pre-shaping uh, and an average model. It doesn't have to be patient specific. And you can see that you can do a very nice preformed reconstruction either in the OR or then you sterilize it later on. And if you are able to, to bend this um, uh, good, you can see that your result is also acceptable. If you take a look at the posterior ledge, if you take a look at the S shape, if you take a look at the position here in the back, so this is just average shaped implant. And this is not far away from patient specific, to be honest. Okay. So if you are able to do like this, it's perfect. Okay. Yeah, Rudy, the question yeah. I have is how do you ascertain, uh, how do you keep it safe when you're going post for posterior dissection and what is your indicator for limits for posterior dissection as in this case if you have shown and if and how do you earmark the posterior medial bulge just as a revision because i've had another message okay. me privately if we could get the key anatomic points again so now that with the pick in hand if you can just explain it to them once okay again, please so there are some some things which are important in dissecting the orbit just have to give you a better this. So usually if you dissect the orbit, we start always with the trans conjunctural approach. I will maybe give you some pictures later. When you start dissecting it, the best option is going from lateral. So starting lateral, going back to the inferior orbital fissure. If you have identified the inferior orbital fissure, most of the time you have to dissect it. If you take a look at the anatomical book, you will get uh, like a heart attack if you see what structures go through there. But interestingly, there is no harm if you dissect the inferior orbital fissure. It becomes tricky in the back, in the superior orbital fissure, and on top of it, the optical canal. 
So start dissecting from the lateral because it gives you a good uh, orientation towards uh, the inferior orbital fissure. If you have reached the end of the inferior orbital fissure, the superior orbital fissure comes and you see this little bony bridge. And then you know this is the way where you have to stop. Don't dissect the superior orbital fissure and don't dissect even far back the uh, optical canal. This is from lateral. From the medial view, you have the ethmoidal arteries. So you have the first and the second one. So if you cut and dissect the first one, and um, this should be, then you are in the safe zone. If you leave the second ethmoidal artery, then you have, I think, maybe one centimeter or a little bit less left towards the optical canal. So medially, it's the ethmoidal artery, the first and the second one, so the anterior and the posterior. Never dissect further than the posterior one. And from the lateral view, it's the end, sorry, it's the end of the inferior orbital fissure. And usually the lateral part of the orbit is not fractured. And in the back, it's already a uh, sphenoid bone. So it's the greater wing of the sphenoid bone. And in most cases, it's not fractured. And this gives you a safe dissection very far back. And if you have reached this, then you can switch to the medial orbital wall, and you can use your ethmoid arteries, the anterior and the posterior one. There are better pictures than this here um, in the anatomical book, and don't go further back than the uh, second one. Usually it's enough to stop, it depends on your implant, to stop after the first. Okay? Rudy, just a, a small uh, question from everybody. Uh, you spoke about a transconjunctival approach. That is the common one you use for uh, isolated orbital injuries. And uh, with your standard transconjunctival, are you able to reach uh, your uh, ethmoidal artery levels uh, comfortably, or would you want to modify it uh, with any any uh, any of your own tweaks? So, um, if if we uh, do uh, would go uh, very far up to the medial wall, then uh, we would go for a transcaruncular excision. But to be honest, in 100 cases, this was only necessary once. So if you dissect the transconjunctional approach correctly, you, always, you almost have a 270 degree approach of orbital floor, medial wall, and lateral orbital wall. Not at once, so not at one glance, you see everything at once, but you can go almost 270 degrees without using a transcaruncular incision. So mostly it's not necessary. And uh, lateral cantatomy, I have never used this in my life for inserting orbital implants. So if you do this incision correctly, you should be fine. And most of the time, you, you don't know even you don't even need a lateral cantatomy. Thanks, Rudy. And to be honest, it, it's not it's not transcaruncular. To be to be honest, it goes not through it. It goes either anterior of it or posterior of it. No one goes directly directly through it. Yeah. And, and it feels a little bit at the beginning, it feels strange because you don't know what you are cutting. So most of the time you don't need it. Thank you. Okay, this is just an example of a uh, um, completely smashed zygomatic bone. And uh, this was completely reconstructed by handband titanium meshes. We now have in this patient a 15 year follow up. You can see the virtual plan, segmentation of the healthy side, mirroring it to the contralateral side. And again, no matter when you talk about orbital reconstruction, the outer frame, you can see in green here, this is the most important thing you have to restore first. If you do, don't do this correctly and you reconstruct the orbit true to original, your position of the globe might differ because your zygoma gives you the relation of its, if it's anothermic or exothermic. So be very important to so be very precise in reconstruction in reconstructing this outer frame. There's, there's another thing I will uh, tell you later um, about the sequencing of these fractures. And um, I will show you this here, maybe like this. Where would you, maybe a question to the audience, where would you start in such a fracture? What would be your, your sequence of, of reduction? 
I don't know if, if something like this is possible. I will come to this, I will come to this later. And um, again, it's very important to make a correct adjustment of your CT scan. So you should be able to see the um, condals at the same height. You should be able to see the, the course of the zygomatic arch at the same time in the zygoma. And now you are able to really judge your deformity. And as you can see here, this is where it starts at the back. And if you follow the principles of the AO CMF, what we usually do in such a case, is start um, fixing the fracture from here to get, first of all, this dimension correctly. If you start here, you will end up having maybe problems in the sagittal projection of the zygoma. That's why in such a fracture, if this here at the, at the root of the zygomatic arch, if you have a fracture there, I recommend to start here with your uh, osteosynthesis coming from back to the anterior. And then you have the same dimensions here and here, and you have to correct sagittal position of the zygoma. You do a lot of mistakes if you start here and you don't correct it here. You, you either have a, a very strange shape of your zygomatic arch, or you have a loss of uh, sagittal projection here. So this is what I can recommend. And for this, you would then go for maybe a coronal approach. Sometimes you can fix this with a leg screw or a long plate going just around the zygoma. So in such a case, I would start from here and develop the fracture from posterior to anterior. So this is one way of treating such a fracture to get the outer frame correctly. But we will come to this later in, in sequencing those fractures. Okay, this is a result 15 years and you can see this is a very biologically very adequate exactly. material. And if you feel the skin in the patient, it's movable on top. He doesn't have any problems with this titanium and I think the result is, is very good. This is um, an example of uh, a biomodel of the patient, which was preoperatively uh, planned by using um, mirror. Mm. What's that question? No, I think it was an audience, no. uh, audience, okay. audience disturbance. Using the easiest way of individualization is the average skull I showed you. The next step is a more patient specific individualization. It's not real patient specific, but it gets close to it. This is what you, I think a lot of you people do using a preoperative CT scan, make a preoperative virtual planning and mirror your, your healthy side to the affected side. And you can see the discrepancy here in this picture very nicely. You export your STL model and you put this model onto your printer or a company that prints it out and then you use a normal standard uh, titanium mesh and you shape it and you shape it according to this, this model. This is the process, the process of individualization using virtual planning, but not a complete um, uh, patient specific implant. And you can see that this fracture goes far up the medial wall. You see how important it is to, to spare the lacrimal system and try not to go too far up in the medial wall in the posterior part. If you take a look, <coughs> excuse me, at the post-operative CT scan, you see that with a transconjunctural approach, you are already almost able to reach the, uh, the frontal base here. And this is for a pre-bent mesh, a very good result. You can see the transition zone is not perfectly in the right position but it's a very good result for hand bending. You can see the sagittal, uh, the, the S shape on top of the posterior bulge. So there's no entrapment of soft tissue in between. And sorry, and uh, sorry, I want to show you the transconjunctural approach and that patient again. So without lateral cantotomy, without transcorunkular incision roots, you are able to insert such a big 
mesh and the post-operative outcome is, uh, I would say, excellent. But if you take a look, and I think now you are able to, to really criticize this reconstruction, if you take a look at the actual view, you can see that the posterior medial bulge is not perfectly reconstructed. And this is, I would say, the limit of handband meshes. It's very hard to, to perfectly find the shape of the posterior medial bulge and to put it at the right position because your mesh can uh, deform during surgery, during insertion. You always have to be uh, careful that it's not uh, changing its shape. And this is, I would say, a weakness of uh, hand bent meshes. They change shape and they are hard to, to form in such a complicated shape for the posterior medial bulge. But I think now everyone can see, this is, this is uh, I would say, on a high level complaining, but you see, the posterior middle bulge is not perfectly reconstructed. These are the standard preformed meshes from Synthes. You can also use them uh, um, as an individualized uh, mesh by using a bio model of the patient. And um, this is very important if you use these kind of meshes. And uh, this is a publication by um, Bradley Strong and Mark Metzger from Freiburg. And um, they show that there's a lot of uh, sharp ends if you um, use these titanium meshes and you have to be very careful uh, by uh, smoothing those surfaces because this is a high risk of entrapment of um, soft tissue. And on the other side, you can see um, the first idea of like a preventive design of implant, an implant that uh, does not do the typical pitfalls yeah, it's not patient specific, it's a standard preform one, but you see it's already smoothened, there are no sharp edges. Um, and this is a, a, another step in development of implants, that implants have been designed now, they uh, try to avoid typical pitfalls of, of surgery. And I will talk to this later, I will talk on this later when you see the patient specific one. So this is the, the uh, Orbital 3 study we, we carried out with the um, AO. And we compared standard preformed meshes versus uh, individualized meshes. So you can see um, we, there were 100 standard preformed meshes in the study, and we had uh, 45 individualized meshes. And only at that time, we were using this for the first time, the real patient specific ones, only three of them. And you can see on um, picture number B, we had 47 of these individualized meshes in the study. And I think this is a very good picture that shows you on the left side. So this is the volume of the orbit and this is called target volume. And the target volume is the volume of the orbit you have mirrored. So the mirrored or orbit, the contralateral healthy orbit is your target volume, which is here. And this is the deviation in a positive and a negative way. You can see the standard preformed implants have a high variety of volume reconstruction. And the more you go towards patient specific, you see how more or how better you are able to reach the target volume. And you see the, the distribution is getting smaller and smaller. So in terms of volume reconstruction, using any kind of uh, computer planning or patient specific brings you to a much better precise reconstruction of the volume. And compare this to the standard preform meshes, you have the highest variation. And these are meshes which were just bent by experienced surgeons intraoperatively. And they are even better than the standard preform meshes. So no matter what virtual planning you use, is it the bio model of the patient? Is it the patient specific one? You see that you reach your target volume much more precise than uh, with the standard preformed ones. So Rudy, if I may interrupt, how was this, how was this volume measured? Was it uh, just the volume or just the rims, the bony outline? It when was you say, the volume. It was the volume. You can measure the volume with the, uh, with uh, the, the brain lab software. With the software. With brain yeah, lab. with the brain lab. Yeah. yeah. You have so, automatic volume uh, calculation. Okay. okay. Okay, so, so Anand, yeah. you want to start off some questions? Yeah. 
No, as far as this goes, uh, Kanan, if you have anything, just go ahead. I'll just pull up uh, and see whether we have any questions. Yeah, there's some come privately. So yeah. now when you when you do it, uh, yeah, Brain Lab, you said you use Invisalias, isn't it? Or do you use Brain Lab software? Brain Lab. Brain Lab, okay, sorry, yeah. So if you are, there was a question when you are using navigation, is that uh, when you have a globe rupture or direct globe injury, would you still use navigation or is there a contraindication there? If the globe is ruptured. Yeah, or there is a direct globe injury. No, if a di direct globe injury, we usually wait. Wait. So it depends. Um, if the patient, if there's still a good chance of uh, restoring visual acuity, we would wait. So wait. we would not go in, in, a, in a traumatized uh, bunk of, um, um, uh, in, a, in any reconstruction. So this would be for us the, the time to wait. Right, time to, okay. And, uh, and sometimes we also have cases where the ophthalmologists say, please don't touch the globe at all, <laughs> yeah. even if it's healed. And then of course you would not go for that. Or we have some patients True. that are blind on one eye and have a very complicated fracture on the healthy eye. And in order to keep their visual acuity safe, we sometimes don't do any reconstructive surgery on those patients. So it's, uh, it's a decision, yeah? Rudy, well, I'll break in here. Uh, I, I had, uh, I had uh, taken the liberty of checking some of your own publications. And uh, I have a few questions lined up based on that uh, uh, from the audience. So uh, there is one more thing. When you come uh, to discussing deep orbital dissection, um, what is your uh, advice to people on how to monitor vision during deep orbital dissection? You cannot. <laughs> okay. Would you use any tests for it? Intraoperative tests that can be used uh, to we, monitor it? We tried. We tried to use a VEP. Mm -hmm. And we, we have a lot of experiences with VEP. There's also a publication from our group using this in optical nerve trauma. And we also applied this in surgery. But we were not able to, because of um, narcotics, because of general anesthesia, and because of, um, because of surgery around the globe that you have any precise measurements of the VEP intraoperatively that might give you an idea of optical nerve trauma. So, as far as I know, and we don't have any option of intraoperatively measuring visual function. The only thing we have is clearly and closely look at the pupillary uh, um, um, yeah, reactions, especially the right, uh, the right afferent pupillary defects. Yeah. That is yeah. RAPDs. RAPDs, okay. exactly. Uh, and uh, some more questions from the uh, audience in terms of, uh, would you have uh, an ophthalmologist uh, with you in the OR when you're operating your orbital surgeries? No. Okay, you, routine, you don't have them routinely. Your no. uh, only thing is in certain cases where they feel there is a contraindication for immediate surgery, you would delay the surgery. That's the only thing. We would do delay, or we sometimes don't carry out at all surgery if the globe is harmed, uh, strongly and maybe has 10% left uh, visual acuity and um, that the chance is high of, of really getting this eye blind, then we would be um, not, not doing any surgery. But every patient with orbital trauma is seen by an ophthalmologist prior to surgery and after surgery. So we have Hello. a close connections with our ophthalmologists, but they are not routinely in our OR because in our hospital in our institution, um, orbital floor fractures are not treated by ophthalmologists, they are treated by max fax. I don't know what's uh, the, the way in India, but mostly in Germany, this is not done by, ophth by ophthalmologists. Do you, do you have any um, oculocardiac reflex incidences when you're using navigation? No. No, not yet, okay. No. So for navigation. That was another question. Yeah. There's, a, there's another question, as you were mentioning with blindness, another question which has come in the presence of head injury um, and then orbital trauma. When would you intervene? Would you leave it to the neurosurgeon or would you want to intervene earlier for the orbit? Yeah. The decision is made by whom? 
the uh, decision is made um, in a board. In, we have a board. In a head injury patient who is stable, yeah. when a timing of intervention, when do you intervene for uh, reconstructing the orbit? So we don't intervene uh, in, the, in the very first uh, days. So we try to give at least two or three days or even more for the swelling to go down. The dissection is much more easier if you wait a few days. This is easier. This is a little different to complex other trauma where the swelling might increase. But in, in those patients, we usually wait a few days and then it's easier. And again, you have to consider a little time that is necessary to produce an implant. So usually we wait and see what, how the patient develops. First of all, the CT scan is the most important thing. We take a look at the key areas, transition zone, posterior medial bulge, lazy S shape, and then we define, is it a, a fracture that needs to be treated or can we maybe try to, to observe and wait a little bit because we need time. If then the patient develops anophthalmus and hypoglobus in a not really clear fracture, then we would go for maybe a little later delayed primary construction. If we have a clear fracture, we would also take a little time because the time we need to have for the patient specific implant to be produced. And this is something between uh, five to seven days in Germany. So this is a perfect window for operating those patients. If you are very fast, five to seven days, we get delivered the implant, the swelling has go down and you can do a, a, a little delayed primary construction. So this is our way of a clear orbital floor fractures with all um, key areas fractured and maybe uh, the muscle uh, shape has changed what I told you. So something like this, a clear fracture, we would do like this. If it's not really clear, if it's a minor fracture, we usually wait. Okay. But we have changed our protocol from a more aggressive way of treating every orbital fracture by more now being more sophisticated with imaging and analysis and experience that um, these uh, key areas have to be fractured most of the time that patients develop anosamos and hypoglobus. Uh, Rudy, there are a number of questions uh, yeah. based on orbital emergencies like retropulbar hemorrhage and traumatic optic neuropathy coming in. Do you want to take them now or do you have slides in the end which would handle them? I don't, I don't have slides for that. Okay, would you care um, to explain now then straight away? Uh, what is your take on uh, patients having retrobulbar hemorrhage as well as uh, traumatic optic neuropathy? And how do you manage oh, them? Okay, retrobulbar hematoma. Um, I have some slides. Um, if you just give me a time, um, it's not in this presentation. Maybe we can handle it in the end if you are comfortable with that. Let's not. I uh, okay, I can, I can do it in the end. I can also show you some slides. Yeah. It, it's no, not uh, the same so. presentation but it's a presentation I held in India <laughs> ah. some years ago. Yeah, okay. So then I think we can continue. So now we, I think we are reaching the, the ladder of evolution starting from meshes bent by hand to average skull to bio model of the patient going up to really patient specific ones. And this is the last step so far. And now I'm coming back again to trajectorial navigation. Maybe you remember what I told you, the entry point and the target point. And this is information we can include in a patient specific implant. And this makes the patient specific implant more than just a plate. It makes the implant functionalized. So we can put information into the implant, for example, for navigation that helps us inserting the implant even more precisely. And this is the next step of individualization. So we can see these tracks in the implant. We can manufacture the implant with a track, like uh, for the navigation pointer, you can put this, the pointer here and you follow the track until the target and you have prior to surgery defined your entry point and your target point between the transition zone is a very important uh, key area. And this is the oblique sagittal plane. Maybe remember this plane be between the infraorbital nerve and the optical canal. And this gives you the perfect uh, complete view over the, um, the, the, the orbital floor. And this can be brought into your navigation system. Target, entry, 
target entry, you have your two trajectorial lines and these are the lines printed in your implant. And you can also see, you can include in such a patient specific implant, whatever you want. You can include your name, you can include the patient's name, you can include measurements like this. Um, you can see the tracks here for the navigation. We have included stops. So there is no, no limit in design what you can do with that implant. And those tracks make this not only a patient specific implant, but this implant has more information included like a functionalization of a patient specific implant. And those features help you intraoperatively to reduce pitfalls. So like a wrong insertion of the implant. Yeah. If you take a look at those two tracks and you know one track is the oblique sagittal, the other track should be along the transition zone. So this is also a help for optical navigation by including the implant into the orbit like this. You know where's your transition zone, which is here. You know, this is the oblique sagittal plane. You have your implant like this, you have the tracks and you can use them as visualization to correctly insert it, not in this position, not in this position. And again, later check this with navigation. So those tracks have two options for navigation and for uh, um, individualization. So this is a well dissected transconjunctural approach and you have a nice view, as you can see, you see the defect in the orbital floor. You see that we also reduce the soft tissue, which has gone down into the maxillary sinus. It is reduced, put on top of the implant. You can see the two tracks. And now you know that if you only can see this in your, op in your operative view, you only see like, like this amount of, of implant. You never see if it's now at the correct position posteriorly, is it at the correct position medially? Is it at the correct position laterally? And if you now use the pointer <clears throat> to follow your tracks in the navigation system, this gives you a very good option and a very good idea if your implant is at the correct position because you never see simultaneously, is it at the correct position in the posterior back? Is it at the correct position laterally, medially? You can only see the infraorbital one. And if you go further back, you can only see the posterior latch. Okay, you can only see the medial one. You'll never see the implant completely in the correct position. And that's why those tracks together with navigation and the trajectorial navigation almost give you a perfect implant position. Because we know it's not only the implant shape, it's also the position. And patient-specific implants also have a chance of being wrongly positioned. Also, they have a perfect shape, yeah? Because you have some options along the infraorbital rim, which is here. If you can see this, it's also possible that, that the implant might fit here or a little bit more there. You still have some discrepancy. Also, it's patient specific. And also it should have a one fit only position. And to reduce these errors, and to reduce the error in the back, because if you tighten that screw here, it can happen that the implant goes up in the back here. Also it's patient specific. And in order to avoid this, the navigation and the imaging together help you and really tell you it's correct and it's not pointing up in the back because you never see the whole mesh completely at one glance. This is the problem of orbital surgery. And those implants help you to reduce those typical pitfalls, like wrongly positioning implants, like entrapment of soft tissues. And you can see the edge of the implant, it's made a little bit thicker. And this is what we call the preventive design. So you don't harm any soft tissues. There are no sharp edges here. And in the back, we do this inverted snow shovel so that the implant will never go up in the back and harm optical nerve or soft tissues. And this is, again, what I said is called the um, preventive design. So this is not just an implant. This is more than a plate. This has functions like prevention of soft tissue damage and helping you putting it in a perfect position. And this is uh, your intraoperative C arm. You can see one color is the preoperative imaging. One color is the post-op uh, C-arm and your planning. 
And this is in real time, like the fusion, zack, it's done. And then you see the overlay between implant and uh, virtual plan. And you can see the implant planning is in red. So just sorry. The implant in, in red here. And you see the, the perfect position of the plate. And you can also see that there's always a small amount of medial wall covered to correct the transition zone. This is operative result, pre-operative plan, operative result, pre-operative plan. Just a second. So now it's a, a very funny moment. <laughs> I am on call and there's a patient coming with a retrobarber hematoma. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I, I'm not kidding. So um, yeah. So the, the resident will call me when the patient is in the emergency department. And um, I don't know how much time I will have left. And this is uh, the post-operative uh, result of the patient. Okay, um, this is another case of anophthalmos. You can see the navigation interoperatively. You can see the autopilot in the left upper quadrant. You can see the trajectorial lines I am following. You can see the reconstructed posterior medial bulge and you see how far back you are. Now the, the system says target reached. I'm at the end of the implant. It's in the correct position. And this is uh, the, the good help of, um, of interoperative navigation. This is the preoperative uh, CBCT scan. You see the virtual reconstruction of this huge orbital floor defect. You see the soft tissue, which is in the maxillary sinus. And this is the intraoperative imaging fused. And you see the position of the implant on top of it, which is almost perfect. And this is even better than navigation if you have this option in the OR. So I would prefer the C arm over the navigation if you have to decide only one you can buy. So post-operative result. And um, I will show you another um, CT scan, how important it is to have a very detailed fracture analysis. And you can see here the loss of the posterior medial bulge. Can you see it? If you go in the coronal view, it's also fractured here. Yeah, it's not only fractured there. So the transition zone has fractured. And, and in the sagittal plane, you see the same defect. So always take those three uh, views. Always try to make a good alignment of the data set that it symmetrically goes through the oblique sagittal plane take a look at the axial view and uh, take a look at the posterior medial bulge, take a look at the transition zone. And this sometimes for education reason, you can use the endoscope to, to explain the resident. This is the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. And on top of it, this is the infraorbital nerve. This is everything here is the defect. And here, this is the posterior ledge, okay? posterior wall of the maxillary sinus, inferior orbital fissure. And this little bone is like the fracture of the orbital floor into the maxillary sinus. And on the other side, you can see the patient specific implant. And as you can see, there's no bone visible anymore. It's on top of the posterior ledge. This is the navigation. You can see again that your pointer is on track. Yeah, you can see that the pointer is on track. <clears throat> Here, you are on track. <clears throat> and um, also you can see that you have reached the end and the end is the posterior ledge where your two tracks fuse together at the posterior ledge in the end. And this supposed opportunities can you see this excellent reconstruction of the posterior middle bulge, which is perfect. And this is really hard to, to achieve with only hand bent meshes. And again, this is the fracture 
simulation reconstruction intraoperatively, perfect position of the mesh on top of the posterior middle bulge. So this is a, a, a kind of position you don't reach with hand bent meshes, only you ha have hands like, like God. Okay, so this is just the patient and the patient specific implants with the navigation, the functionalized implant. Are there any questions so far? And um, maybe I don't know when she will call me, but um, shall we keep on, on going on? Yeah, we'll, we'll do the questions now and then probably we will finish it. Anna, so do you want to ask the questions? The next topic then would be NOE. Uh, you, you A little bit. And, uh, uh, Kanan, I'll just pick out uh, some of the ones which they've asked. I, I'm, I'm picking out as well. Okay. Now the question was, uh, Rudy, in secondary and primary, if there is a big loss uh, for secondary, when there is a secondary deformity correction. So there might be some soft tissue loss as well. So you are only correcting the bony ledge. So what if there is persistent in ophthalmus? How do you do? Do you overcorrect? If you want to overcorrect, how much do you overcorrect? Or else do you use any fillers? So we haven't used um, any fillers. We haven't used fat so far but maybe this might be an option. And in secondary cases, coming, we, try, coming, coming. we try to reconstruct um, the, the shape of the orbit as good as possible. So this is the basis of our reconstruction. So all the key areas and intraoperatively, if you still have anosalmus, we would either go for Calvaria split bone grafts and adjust the position of the globe intraoperatively and just by clinical judgment and usually we try to go for two millimeters over correction. But this is just a rule of thumb. But again, okay. it's hard to predict, but especially if soft tissue is uh, atrophied, if it's scarred, if it's lost. Um, fat grafting in the orbit might be an option. I have read about that, but I haven't tried that so far. But so far, we're just trying to reduce the volume more and more either with calvarius split bone grafts or with little titanium chips. I don't, I think I don't have them on my uh, presentation. Um, the spacers, but we have made a publication okay. for this. So the titanium spacer for volume augmentation, this is like just calvarius split bone grafts printed out in titanium. You just put in titanium pieces of metal and bringing the globe forward and up. Yeah, but this is clinical judgment intraoperatively. Okay. Yeah, no, no way of predicting no, that. Predicting no that. Way. So two mm overcorrection is what you think as of now. We think of this, but again, you talked about soft tissues. Your lower yeah. eyelid has to yeah. follow your overcorrection. If it does not, you cannot go for do, two millimeters. Do Do you suspend your lower eyelid tissues onto the mesh or something routinely? Sometimes not stop. routinely. Okay. Sometimes not routinely. In um, Diplopia correction, have you encountered if there is persistent diplopia even after a good reconstruction? There are some cases who so, uh, have severe consisting diplopia. Even but after again, reconstruction, what do you yeah, do? Uh, how do you proceed? So the, the next step, so first of all, what you already told, in diplopia patients, we try to do a perfect reconstruction first. If it does not get better, we wait at least six months. After six months, if it's not better, patient has two options. Either he use prism glasses, which help him getting along with diplopia, or eye muscle surgery. Okay, like squint, yeah. This Press is the only prisms. option you have. Yeah, yeah. okay. Yeah. You, you wouldn't go in and you, you don't think there's any role for steroids or anything or intramuscular steroids or something, nothing. No experience with that, to be honest. Okay. Yeah. But on the other side, to be honest, it's a very rare number of cases. Agreed. It's yeah. very rare. Yeah. yeah. With regard to traumatic optic neuropathy, do you see a lot of cases of uh, uh, traumatic optic neuropathy primarily with uh, no vision or post-surgical? Have you come across or anything? And how do you go about managing traumatic optic neuropathy? Um, so post-surgically, um, our numbers are 0.01%. During okay. orbital surgery, since we're using patient-specific implants like this, and we've used, been using this since 2013 or 14, 
I'm, I can recall maybe one case in six or seven years. So for us, the number of complications compared to the titanium headband brushes has significantly, significantly dropped. But, but still there's a low risk of intraoperative uh, optic nerve uh, trauma, but it's less than 0.01%. You see if you cases, have this, then we yeah. remove the implant. Okay. The only chance you have, patient wakes up, not seeing anything, implant is removed, we give steroids, and if there's a hematoma, we drain the hematoma. Do you see them primarily? I mean, without uh, surgery, they present to you with traumatic optic neuropathy. Also very rare, but we see, and uh, from our experience, elderly women in Germany with uh, anticoagulation, are on a higher risk for that. So they, they have like a fall on the stairs, they have a fracture of the orbit, they bleed into the orbit. And we have a few cases, but most of the time it's elderly women with anticoagulation. A real traumatic optic neuropathy or even like cutting the nerve traumatically is, is so rare. I, I can maybe recall one or two cases since I'm working here in, in the hospital. I, I think you see maybe uh, more of those cases in your country. Uh, maybe yeah. more car accidents, maybe more um, interpersonal violence. I don't know, but it's it's a very very rare condition. And we we treat this with uh, steroids. Also, there is also some there are some publications that say don't do this. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> but again, you don't have anything you can do. <laughs> you can just wait, <laughs> or you can put the patients onto onto steroids. Yeah. Yeah, no, true. Uh, there's a study by the Oftal group saying three steroids, nothing, and surgery, steroids have a better result. So probably yes. we are there only. Yeah. If we have a hematoma, which is visible and the nerve is not mm. cut on a CT or MRI scan, we go for evacuation of the hematoma with steroids. If it's not yeah. enough, we decompress one or two orbital walls as well. In the absence of navigation, do you have any techniques or tips to help in positioning of the mesh posteriorly right at the point? Yes. Um, the, 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 best, the best way is, um, I, I think the, this is the best picture for that. So try to take a look at um, this fracture here. So this is without navigation. I'll stop it. If you have a fracture, go into the maxillary sinus with your instrument and find the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus. This is a safe zone, nothing can happen. If you have identified it here, slowly and slightly use an elevator or here, uh, this is just the suction to follow the posterior wall cranially until you reach the posterior ledge. And this is without navigation, as you can see. But in order to achieve a dissection like this, you have to make a complete dissection of the orbit from the lateral to the medial. And you most of the time in those fractures have to dissect the inferior orbital fissure, which usually I would say in 99% doesn't cause any problem. No matter if some uh, strange nerves go through it, there's also like an artery going through the lateral orbital wall and somehow communicating with the retinal artery. So there are publications of like a, a communication between two arteries um, going through the inferior orbital fissure and communicating with the retinal artery or the optical artery and that you might cause blindness by, uh, by uh, cauterizing this artery. But I haven't had any case and I haven't had read any publication on this, but there is some people, they, they are very cautious about this artery going there. But again, using anatomical landmarks help you dissecting the orbit, starting from lateral, going to the inferior orbital fissure until the inferior orbital fissure stops, then coming from medial using the ismoidal artery, anterior and posterior, and for the floor, go into the maxillary sinus if it's fractures, Use the posterior wall of the sinus here as a landmark. There is nothing that can happen here. And slightly and slowly push uh, your soft tissues with an elevator on top of it and put the mesh under it. 
and usually uh, you are still at least one or one and a half centimeters away from the optical mm -hmm. canal and this, uh, so this is still safe here, yeah? There is yeah. no, no higher risk of damaging the optic nerve, which is up here, one or one and a half centimeters. Centimeter. That's, that's a nice uh, pick actually, thank you. There is uh, another question which says, have you had implant failure? What is implant failure? A fracture or uh, no. whatever, loosening of implants for surgery. No, so we had to, there are some implants that had to be removed because patients had problems, only a few. One patient we had to remove what it problems? because. Hmm? What, what do you mean by patient having problems? Allergic these, these are or? very, yeah, these are very uns, unspecific problems um, and only a few cases. So there are, pa are patients who complain about strange pain in the orbit. Oh. They have some like uh, uh, disturbance problem here in the infraorbital rim. And uh, some of those cases, but I would not condol, call this implant failure, but this can happen with any titanium plate, with any screw, with anything you do. Um, but still it's very, very rare that an implant has to be removed, which is on a good and perfect position. But I can't tell you any numbers so far, but we are analyzing our results now for within the last six or seven years of these implants. Yes. But it's so rare that I cannot even recall it. The implants, they do not fracture. They do not bend. Fracture, yes. Yeah, no fractures, no bending, no, no infections. I cannot recall a, a single infection. Also, the titanium is completely exposed to the maxillary sinus. The application by um, Von Schubert, who could show that titanium is completely covered by mucosa. Yeah, mucosa, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's, yeah. There's what's, no problem. What's your take on absorbable implants? Sorry. What's your take on absorbable implants? As I previously said, a reconstruction that resorbs is not a reconstruction. Not a reconstruction, yeah. So. You can maybe, so, but please, please don't uh, tape me now because if my boss <laughs> uh, hears <laughs> this, um, maybe you can use those uh, for a very small defect where the key areas are not fractured. No, no, I've, I've heard Alexander Schramm say that as well. Will it resolve and what will replace it? So he has told it with yeah, a wink. Yeah. So, <laughs> so uh, we, we are completely off because people say you have a very small defect, um, which is not affecting the key areas, only in the middle of the orbital floor, everything is fine. But then the question is yeah. why to operate at all? So yeah. <laughs> if you operate it, the indication is a clear fracture of the key areas. And if you have this, you will end up having anophthalmos and hypoglobus, and then I would go for anything that is from stable. It can be polyethylene, it can be um, peak, it can be titanium. So these are very good uh, materials, but they have to be, you need to see them on your CT scan yeah? Yeah. to check if it's in the correct position or not. Uh, th there's a question which is saying, what is the degree of scope which you use in the orbit? Is it 30 degree scope? Uh, we don't use it on a regular basis. It's a 30 degree uh, yes, angle yeah. scope um, yeah. just for um, sinus surgery. Yeah. Yeah, the same one. Yeah. So yeah. that answers Winky. I just tried this and I think it's nice it's, for visualization. No. Yeah, and no. It, the, sometimes it helps if you don't know where you are. Yeah. So that, that's what I was asking you about. When we look at pre op planning, make a model, adapt the mesh, keep the mesh yeah. intraoperatively, and check it with an endoscope. So it'll save us an expensive navigation software or in of course, CT. Of course, of course, it does. You're right, yeah. Yeah. So again, navigation is a nice to have a gimmick, yeah, to play around for, for adults. But yeah, I'm, I'm not denying it till we reach there, probably. Yeah, but to be honest, if you would have the chance to decide between imaging and navigation, I would go for the intraoperative imaging now. Oh, all right. Yeah. Cool. Why is that, if I may ask? I think I already uh, explained, uh, explained it a little, yeah, true. but um, as, uh, I think uh, Anand, you, you gave a perfect description of uh, the difference yeah. between uh, navigation and, and imaging. And if you really can see the photo, the navigation, uh, the photo of your reconstruction in the, in the CBCT scan, it's even more better, more precise than the navigation. Yeah, so you feel more comfortable. That's you, the most you feel more comfortable. You, you have proof of surgery. You don't need any uh, learning skills. And this is a very flat curve in navigation. You need to trust navigation. 
it sounds it sounds strange, but you need to trust. Am I really there? Is my registration correct? Is is any um, planning done wrong? So navigation has little pitfalls, and interpretive imaging shows you your result. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, yeah. So sorry, Rudy. There is an interesting question which. Um, it says, have you had experience with uh, adherence of tissues on the implant post reconstruction? If so, what would you do? No. No? No. Yeah. With titanium, you don't see that, isn't it? So the mesh, um, so the mesh is inherent. So if you, we did some secondary corrections with the normal titanium mesh. I'm not talking now um, about the patient specific ones. They can be easily dissected, just smoothly, uh, everything is covered. But the real meshes I showed you prior, they are completely grown in with soft tissue, with epithelial cells. So they are completely inherent and they are a big, big mess to remove. But these can be easily removed. But the, the, there's another important thing. You even don't need a screw to fix it. If you do a re-entry in such an implant, it will be fixed because of some osteo, uh, conductive uh, um, features of the titanium, this is more or less stable. The contact to bone of such an implant makes it stable. Most of the time you don't need a screw. It's fixed. Yeah. There's bone growing maybe onto the, uh, the surface is not smooth of those implants. And this, is my, this might be like a tertiary, uh, tertiary stability like in dental implantology. I don't know, but they are fixed, they are stable. Yeah. Rudy, okay. there's one more question. Yeah. Uh, in large defects, let us say the patient has some symptoms which evoke a need for implant removal. Okay. Uh, on yeah. of the implant, do you find that the uh, already achieved result has uh, lost its outcome? Would you want to replace it with another material after some time? Um, please, please again. Please again. Yeah. Uh, there is a large defect which has already been reconstructed with an implant. With what implant? Uh, let's say a titanium implant. And Such then, a patient specific one or what do you mean? No, any, any implant, patient yeah. specific or uh, stock. Yeah. Uh, and the patient has a, a symptom because of which we are removing like vague facial, vague uh, pain in the orbit, which does not uh, resolve. And you feel that it may be because of the implant and you are removing it after some time. Uh, do you think it will uh, affect the outcome of the orbit uh, reconstruction? Would you want to re uh, redo the reconstruction after some time or would you just leave it? I think it's a very individual decision um, and a lot of talking to the patient. Um, I think there's no, no standard uh, way or algorithm for that. Um, if you remove the implant and you, you are able to keep the envelope of scar and soft tissue and maybe the changes in the orbit are not very strong, could be. Um, and if everything is stable clinically, I would then not go for a secondary construction if the patient is okay, if there's no diplopia, if the position is okay, I would probably not go for another reconstruction. However, if you, by removing the implant, destroy the soft tissue envelope, the periorbit, the scar, which, is, which, might, which can be a very strong, um, and the patient's having anophthalmos uh, or hypoglobus again, and he complains about that, it's maybe diplopia or whatever, then yes, you, you might be forced to do something. But maybe in such a case, if one implant was not accepted by the patient, you would have to go maybe for like a um, bailout strategy, maybe using bone in such a case or using another material. But I think this is a very individual decision with the patient and you, and his complaints. And, but, they are, but to be honest, there are also patients where they remove the implants and they still have pain. So we are very, very careful with removing implants because most of the time they do not explain the symptoms in my uh, personal view. If the pain is there, if it's a chronic pain and you remove the implants most of the time, I think nothing changes. It's like Team J surgery. <laughs> Um, a question which has come is in secondary deformity, when yeah. the zygoma has not been fixed well, would you, yeah. with the, the rim being discontinuous, would you look at an osteotomy to correct it or fill it up with an implant, preformed implant alone? 
both options are fine. Both options have to be discussed with the patient. patient. Does he want to go for uh, osteotomy with a coronal incision? Or is he happy by just putting some uh, camouflage uh, uh, peak implants or whatever? If you can correct, so both options are for me completely fine. If, if you go the, the golden way, then I would uh, personally maybe try to do an osteotomy of the zygoma. But again, you can do this with virtual planning and patient specific implants as well, so that your, your zygoma is at the right position. And at the right zygoma position, you can plan your patient specific orbital implant, which fits at your corrected outer frame. So there's a lot of options you have. And um, I think um, my personal opinion, if possible, use your, your own bone and not peak if the patient is happy with a bigger surgery and correct the inner orbit with a titanium implant. So that from the outside, you don't have any, or well, not too much uh, metallic. I know there are, um, and my boss uses also a lot of patient PSIs here and here for uh, doing osteotomies of the zygoma. This works also very fine, but again, you have to discuss this with your patient. Does he want a lot of material or does he want to have his original bone? But those options are completely fine. But again, you have to plan your PSI or your orbital reconstruction on the new position of the zygoma, otherwise it doesn't fit. And yeah. sometimes it's advisable to do it in two steps because you don't know how the globe uh, can move or moves. So you can do this also in two steps. Correct the outer frame first, then go for the orbit. So there are several options possible. I mean, in your experience, which is the best navigation system huh? in the market? Okay, so um, I think you've got a call. So this is a resident coming. She saw me the CT scan of the hematoma, and she just told me that I think we have to do the decompression. Um, yeah. I think we will have a little time until he goes direct to, to surgery, and. Um, Okay. Ravin, I think, lost I, I, think I will have a, a few minutes until we start the surgery. So I, will, I will have some time because they have to directly bring him into uh, the OR. OR. So I will, we have a little more time. What so in terms of read, navigation read, equipment you have used? The best? Yeah, or in the market which is available. We, we only have used Voxim, the very old one, maybe 15 or 20 years ago, and now Brain Lab. And I think, I think personally, uh, BrainLab is leading the market. I think these are the best systems available with the most uh, convenient software. Just give me a look. Yeah. Hat sie dieses verlost? Yeah, so this, this is a hematoma. I can show you maybe in real time. <laughs> um, can you see this? So, and you can see that the optic nerve is stretched that the globe is not round anymore. It's like a talib. It changes its shape. And you see at the lateral zygoma on the left side, you see that there's an extra conal hematoma. So it's not in the conus. So between nerve and muscles, it's extra conally. But again, it's like a space occupying lesion that pushes the globe forward. And the patient has uh, a no visual acuity at the moment at the left side. Uh, Doc, can you just uh, stop sharing the screen so that uh, that video can be visible clearly? Otherwise, it will be very minimized screen. It didn't you see that? Yeah, we, we saw that. I think that but was okay. But in YouTube, uh, it will not be that visible. Oh, okay. There are about 200 watching it in YouTube as well. Yeah. <laughs> oh. oh, did I show the patient's name? Hopefully not. <laughs> Nobody can see it. Don't worry. <laughs> really? <laughs> you, you... This is a problem. Just a second. Sorry. 
Vamos a ver. Ok, vamos a sentar. Okay, I'm sorry. Um, yeah. So um, if, if we talk about Dritoboy hematoma, we have uh, a way I can, I can show you this. Like, um, this was a presentation in, in, in Amritsa. Now Amit is smiling. Um, can you see? No, you cannot see it, right? Can you see this? Hello? Yeah, um, we which, can which? see your screen, but yeah, can we you can see, see your cursor move. And the, the, the slide as well, or only the cursor? The slide is there, yeah. The slide is there. Operative visualization is the slide. Which one with the titanium implants here? It's the navigation slide which we have. Ah, okay, yeah. Um, making this smaller. Neufeiger, just a second. I give you this. So these are the titanium spaces for secondary corrections, yeah? And um, this is a case of what we did prior. You see the outer frame with titanium and uh, secondary for correction, the split bone grafts before we had those spacers, yeah? And this is like a, a case I can show you with an implant, secondary osteotomy and PSI. Like this. And the clinical outcome later on. Okay, but now I think we want to go for the optic nerve thing. So this, these are um, two publications we did uh, a few years ago, and we have developed a way of decompression um, without doing lateral cantotomy and with having a good efficacy of uh, evacuating hematoma. Because lateral cantotomy, the problem is you cannot remove hematoma. You only give the globe a little bit more freedom to, to go forward, but the hematoma stays inside. And in order uh, to remove this, that this, this was a restaurant in, in Amritsa, and you see from the publication, the hematoma, you can see the, the stretched optic nerve, you can see the exophthalmos, the loss of visual acuity, and you see the hematoma in the, in the sagittal view and in the coronal view. And this is the patient with a fixed and dilated pupil. You can see that. And you can see the transcutaneous incision with four drainages, penrose drainages. And this is uh, from the publication. So we do four incisions, two in the upper eyelid, two in the lower eyelid, go onto the infraorbital rim and the supraorbital rim, go subperiostally and go into the orbit. And then in order to evacuate hematoma, um, if it's intracolony, you have to open up the periorbit. Otherwise, the hematoma won't come out. If it's the extra caudal hematoma, what I showed you here, it should be uh, enough just to go superiorly in, into the hematoma of, of the CT scan. Okay, so this this is uh, the way of uh, our way, this transcutaneous incision. And if you see it's not enough, you can use those four incision to use an elevator to break down the orbital floor to break down the medial wall, to give more decompression bony ones if the patient, for example, doesn't have an orbital fracture. Yeah? And um, for us, the most important thing is, um, ah. <laughs> the most important thing is fixed and dilated pupil. We have the RAPD, we have a loss of visual acuity and we have the stretched optic nerve and the change of shape in the, in the globe. So these are the, the most important signs. And these things together is for us the indication for surgery. Yeah. If Huge the visual navigation. acuity is fine, 
if we have navigation there, if we have an adequate image, yes, mm -hmm. then we use this as well. But if you only do the transcutaneous incision, you don't need navigation. You would only need it if you go for the um, bony decompression. And you can see this is also extra conal. Yeah? yeah. You see that the orbit is somehow still intact. Maybe the bleeding comes from a, a pre or post septal artery here. There's also pre septal hematoma, but it has gone into the orbit, pushing the globe forward and making it looking like a tulip and the stretched optic nerve compared again to the S shaped nerve here. Yeah. And if you see these three signs, for us, that's the indication to go in. If the visual acuity is fine, we just monitor them very closely. Yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. Anand? Yeah. I think most of the questions regarding uh, bulbar hemorrhage and uh, traumatic optic neuropathy is uh, handled it already. And uh, those two are fabulous publications. Um, I think everyone should have a read at them. Uh, they uh, clearly indicate the uh, absolute indications for intervention as well as when to wait and watch. Uh, yes. Congrats, uh, Rudy, on that uh, brilliant papers. I don't know if it's brilliant, but I think it's it's the first step of a kind of an algorithm which is easily can be easily performed. Reproducible, and, yeah. And the other option is you can also do this in local anesthesia. Those four incisions, no problem, easily to be uh, uh, anesthetized with local anesthesia. It's not good. It's not it's not comfortable for the patient. But um, you have good access, you have good drainage of the hematoma, and you don't need to perform the lateral cantotomy. So the eyelid and the, the suspension of the eyelid is intact. It doesn't, it doesn't get destroyed. And you have a good way of really getting out hematoma and not only just giving more flexibility to the lower eyelid. Okay. But again, uh, everybody says you have one hour and usually those patients come in two hours, three hours after trauma, but still we try to. Sure. So if the visual acuity is not there, or so we know that uh, the probability is very low after one hour, we still would go for surgery. If the visual acuity is gone, if we have CT with a hematoma, we would go for the decompression. That's nice, that's really good. So I think uh, I, I would just wait for the surgery to start, but I think we can use the time if if the audience is still interested. Uh, uh, a little bit. Uh, Anand, yeah. Anand, shall we just discuss the questions for NOE so that he also won't be rushed for time? Yeah, yeah, sure. I think you can take them Instead up. Instead of going in for the lecture. Rudy, I think Rudy. we have less time now. So we okay. will uh, post specific questions to you regarding NOE fractures, which Kanan will take you through. And I think uh, if you're able to answer that, we'll have a lot of clarity. Okay, so I will just wait for some... Uh... I will wait for questions, right? No, no, yeah, questions for NOE. We will just uh, take them some questions and you can okay, use your slides just to explain. Yeah. yeah. So some, okay. one, of, one question which has come is the simplest. Do you use navigation for NOE as well? Uh, sometimes when not on a regular basis. With NOE fractures. It it, it depends. Uh, it depends on the other fractures. So usually NOE fracture is not isolated. So you often have um, zygomatic uh, bone fractures. You have uh, frontal sinus fractures, and often those patients have like open facial fractures. And in those cases, yes. But only for NOE, I don't see a big big advantage. If the outer frame. Is, is intact, you have a good orientation for the bone cranially and laterally, then you don't need navigation. Yeah. If there is an existing wound there, which is giving you reasonable yeah. access to the wound, would you, and you probably need medial canthopexy, would you still go for a bicoronal or would you try and do it through the existing laceration? Um, you, can, you can also do like a modif modified uh, transnasal uh, canthopexy with like a glabella approach, which is also possible. And um, 
Um, it depends on the patient, but you would not necessarily have to go for the coronal. You can do it with a glabella approach, but it's much more complicated. Um, yeah. But do you have slides for that? Uh, do you have uh, any slides for what you said? for the labular approach for transnasal fixation of them. Let me have a look. Uh, as you're searching, something to answer from the top of your head. Nasal acrimal duct, uh, do you repair them yourself or do you get your ophthal colleagues to? We repair it by ourselves, but repair means only intubation. We don't have any other options. Any other? Yeah, I think that's what uh, mostly all of us do. Do you do it simultaneously or uh, secondary? Yeah. yeah. You check and yeah. simultaneously. And if it doesn't work, then we would go for a TOTI approach. And most of the time, to be honest, I don't know if really a, a new lacrimal system is. is uh, is, yeah. If, if you're going in secondarily, do you do endonasal or you still do, you make an incision externally, subsidiary? Do you prefer endonasal repair for them? No, we do the incision. We, you do the incision, okay. We would do the incision. Okay, but um, let me have a look. Yeah. Um, Um, so the slides are in German, but the, the pictures might be, um, so this is the glabella approach, which is just a medial incision. You need this, this um, I don't know the English word for that. Uh, you see this, this, this wire and you need this, it's like, it's, I think it's a catch wire. Can you see it? Yeah. yeah. Catch wire, um, you need that to get, um, to pick the wire from the affected side. But you see, so the glabella approach is just a small incision in, in the glabella. And then you have to be very careful to protect the contralateral eye with a spatula. To also go for a small incision on the side. Then uh, it's recommendable to use any kind of um, sleeve to, to help your burr get to the, the right angle and not to harm too, many, too much soft tissue. This is the glabella approach. You see the bone, you see the, the, the hole which has been used with the burr and you see the catch wire, yeah? You put the catch wire through. Then you put in the plate with the catch wire. You push it through to the other side. We also did um, a correction of uh, the upper lid there. And um, this is the glabella approach just for fixing the medial cantal ligament. Okay, it's a little bit more complicated because you don't see a lot, <laughs> but um, but um, still, it's it's like a, it's a modification and it's a possible way of trying to avoid a coronal incision. But still, um, we recommend to use such a plate to put the wire in the in the right um, angle to give a good um, pull of the wire and a good position of the medial cantilever. But you need this catch wire to go through to to get uh, the anchor and to push it through, uh, to pull it through. Uh, Rudy, just a break here. Turn uh, it around and go back. Just a question here. Um, if, if you're looking at uh, 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 mediocanthopexy procedure to be done, would you always prefer to do a transnasal wiring or is there any other option uh, of using an ipsilateral approach alone? Is it always transnasal for you? Like so say if it's soft tissue only. So I can, I can only imagine uh, secondary cases that were transferred to us. And then most of the time we had to go for coronal approaches. We had to go for more complicated secondary uh, osteotomies. 
And I can't re recall a, a single case where we didn't go for transnasal uh, okay. vaccine. I don't, honestly, I don't know. And um, I don't know how stable it is and what the indication would be for that. I think this is a, a more, more a minor modification of the technique, um, which doesn't require a coronal approach. But I think the gold standard, the gold way would be with the coronal approach, the plate in the orbit that puts the wire in the, red, in the correct position. Um, and this cannot be achieved, I think, with, with other techniques that, that are, how can, I, how can I say that, are stable, form stable for, for years. I, I don't know, to be honest. Thank you. Yeah, in, in, in bilateral, how do you anchor them? Do you, what is your reference point if there is bilateral NOE fracture for your medial canthopexy? You, you don't have a real, um, um, if, it depends on the, the fracture and what is fractured. So usually you should be ending up posterior and superior of the lacrimal system. This, is, this yeah. should be the, the landmark for um, putting in, I just maybe have a better picture for that. Okay, so this, this gives it a little bit clearer. Um, if you have a bilateral um, uh, rupture of the media cancer ligament, uh, usually the lacrimal system um, is, is a kind of, um, just give me a second, I will show you pictures. This is the usual uh, way of the media cancer ligament. So some people say there are three limbs, or th this is not only one ligament, these are three ligaments. And um, we have a posterior one, we have um, the superior one and the anterior one. And you can see that the lacrimal canal is uh, in between them. And for the refixation, we usually would not go for the fixation anterior of the lacrimal system, but posterior. If you do it anteriorly, you will have a misdisplacement. I can show you a picture of that later on. So the, the indication, the, 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 the landmark would be the bony, um, the bony holes and the bony, um, how can I say, yeah, where the lacrimal system is located. And if you are posterior and superior to that, this is the, the ideal position for the um, medial cancer ligament. I'll just try to sh show you a, a better picture of that. So this, oh, just give me a second. So this is the anchor we use usually. This is just a step-by-step -step procedure, finding the media cantal ligament, use the needle, go through it, drill the hole and put the blade ipsilaterally that puts the, the right, the correct pull of the ligament posterior and superior. This is very important. And um, you have to also come at posteriorly of the contralateral um, lacrimal system, you have to drill like this as well. So this is a bilateral case. You, you just do the same on the other side and then you must be very careful not to mix up your wires. But if you do this very concentrated and, and focused, um, you can do this on, on both sides as well. But again, the plate is very important. And you should always use the last hole of the plate if you put in the wire. So always the last hole that you exactly know. Um, and you can see here the hole of the lacrimal system. You must be posterior and superior of it. And be careful when you pull the wire at the end, don't pull it, but put the medial cantilever with forceps in the position and then strengthen the wire because otherwise it ruptures. Okay, not just pull the wire, put the medial cantal ligament correctly to the position with forceps and then carefully tighten the wire. And this is a very important picture. And this is, I think, one of the most important take home messages. If you, if you fix the wire anterior to the lacrimal system, you will end up having a dislocation of that segment and you will not be able to put the medial cantal ligament 
at the correct position. So that's why it's very important to fix it anteriorly and to push the wire posteriorly. And this drawing, it's, it's gone um, anterior of the, uh, of the lacrimal system because it's a unilateral one. If it's bilateral, I would not do that. We would go also behind the lacrimal duct. Okay, because otherwise you would have different uh, positions of the candle ligament. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so ipsilaterally is like this, contralaterally go both sides posteriorly. And you it's very important where it goes through. Yeah, so behind the lacrimal duct. Yeah. And you can see this in dissection. You can see the, um, the bony, um, I don't know the English word, so the bony um, surface where the lacrimal system is in. You can feel that, you can dissect it. And it looks very anteriorly on, on this uh, diagram, but in real life, it's very, very, very far deep in the orbit. So don't lose uh, your temper. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Rudy, uh, can you, uh, if you still have time, do you want to run your uh, slides on NOEs? Because uh, the slides look sequence. very, very tempting. Of course. So I think this, this is very clear what region we are talking ab about and uh, in, yeah. Contrary to other fractures, we have a very uh, important soft tissue uh, problem with those fractures and it's the medial cantal ligament and it's the lacrimal duct system, this is clear. It's important to know that you have three uh, limbs and some people say it's not only one medial cantal ligament, it's three of them. And no one really knows um, why it's three and if every three are used and in the reconstruction, we only reconstruct one and we usually go posterior and superior to the lacrimal duct. I think this is the most important thing. And it is also important to know that the classification of NOE fractures is always based on uh, the medial cantal ligament. If you have one big fragment where the ligament is attached to, it's type one. So this again, Paul Manson, I think he was the guy who first described this fracture. Yeah, no one did this before. In the type two, you can see that the uh, that the uh, medial cantal ligament is fixed to a piece of bone, but it's a several piece of bone, so it's a comminuted fracture. And in type three, the medial cantal ligament is ruptured itself. So one and two usually can be addressed by putting the bone into right position. And the third type, there you need to refix the, the, uh, the, the medial cantal ligament. So this is just a CT scan and um, most of the time, it's not an isolated NOE fractures. You have combinations with frontal sinus fractures, with bilateral zygomatic fractures, with level of three fractures, with whatever. And um, the type three, you can see here, it's a completely um, uh, exploded uh, NOE complex. And I think this is for sure, you cannot reduce so many different uh, small pieces of bone with plates and screws. In such a case, you can go for a mesh that keeps the NOE complex small. I think this is uh, clear to the audience. This is the test to see whether the medial cantal ligament is fixed or not. Is it ruptured? You know, if you don't correct this, you will end up having the telecanthus. And this deformity is very hard to secondarily correct because you would have to um, osteotomize the NOE complex again. And everyone knows that this is a real big mess because you, to be honest, you have to destroy it to be honestly, yeah. And um, to get it small, and if you've got it small, then you have to refix the medial cantal ligament. This brings us again back to the idea, as much as possible has, uh, has to be done in the first place, and especially keeping the NOE complex small and tight and avoiding it having the telecanthus deformity with the underlying bone being not reduced properly, like this. So. This deformity should be corrected uh, primarily as good as possible because secondarily, it's very hard to make an NOE complex smaller. This is CT scan. Again, I think it's clear 3D imaging is, is a must. These are just different options of fixing it and um, with wire and um, 
but uh, you can find all these pictures on the AO surgery reference guide, which is a very nice uh, tool. This is something uh, which is uh, special considerations for NOE fractures. Again, if you have such a def defect of the nose, it's also advisable to go there in for the first time and don't do this secondarily because soft tissue will shrink. And this keeps the soft tissue at least in a position where you could go eventually for secondary nose reconstruction. But if you see the nose is completely gone, in the primary case, I would go for a primary bone grafting. And, and the big difference is, as you can see here, you have to put it as far as possible to the tip of the nose and not stopping at the original uh, nasal bone where this stops and where the cartilage starts, you have to make it longer. Otherwise you will end up having a very funny looking nose with no nasal support because the cartilage also does not have any support anymore. Okay, so very important primary bone grafting is necessary. Secondarily, it's a mess and make the, the bone graft longer than the original nasal bone is so that you have a complete support of the, of the dorsum of the nase, of the nose. And um, maybe then you can go for a secondary construction. But if you miss this, soft tissue will go away and you will have a big problem to reconstruct the nose like this secondarily. So I would not call this a reconstruction of the nose, but it's just a support of the soft tissues that they don't shrink. And you have, you buy some time to go for um, um, a nasal reconstruction. Um, another thing you should consider if uh, you have completely dissected um, the soft tissues there, um, you might also put in some bolster dressings like this to keep um, the swelling reduced and to attach the soft tissue to the bone, to the underlying bone. Special consideration also to keep the NOE complex narrow if you don't manage to do this with bones, with, with single screws and plates, you can go for a mesh. And this mesh camouflages and keeps the NOE complex small and together. And this is better done like this than doing it secondarily. So NOE complex must be kept small. And to be honest, it's hard to overcorrect. It's hard to make it too narrow and too small. The only problem if it's too wide, this is almost impossible to correct. So this is, uh, I can, some uh, information about the NOE fractures. Are there any more uh, questions from the audience or from the um, hosts? Rudy, one question is, uh, how do you handle the septum in case of NOE fractures? Is there a need for primary septoplasty uh, along with your dorsal reconstructions? No, the, the bony, the bony um, graft is only to give you the support of the nose and to buy you some time that the soft tissue don't shrink. And then you have to wait until everything has healed. And if you don't have any soft tissue coverage inside, um, a primary uh, reconstruction with, with a cartilage is uh, not a good idea because this will not heal. So first you should go for healing of the soft tissues. If you are lucky, you will end up having like a soft tissue septum and you could reconstruct this later on secondarily with, uh, with uh, cartilage, but not not primarily. If you have primarily a cartilage damage, try to cover it with soft tissue as good as possible. But again, this is no nose reconstruction. This is giving you time, buying you time. Rudy, one question. Do you use, uh, uh, do you use splints, the transcutaneous uh, splints with wire for every case in bilateral? No, no. To be honest, this is only an when option. When do you use it? Yeah. When when do you use it? If you have um um if the skin, if the skin is completely dissected away from the bone, maybe in a NOE fracture which is completely comminuted, and you have you are worried that your soft tissues cannot really adapt to the bone to the underlying bone, so that you end up having a pseudo telecanto. So the bone is correct, but your soft tissue is away. And if your medial cantilever ligament is fixed, still fixed to a piece of bone, but the soft tissue is gone by dissection or whatever, then it can help, yeah? But I, I would not think it's a must. I would only consider it if you can see that all the soft tissues are completely loose here. 
after your reconstruction. Would you use otherwise POP splints? What is POP? A, a Cluster of Paris or any kind of external splint. Like uh, um, if the nose is fractured, yes. Yeah. Yeah. If the, 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 the skeleton of the nose, yes. But not in like a reconstruction with primary bone graft. I would not go for a splint. Yeah. With CSF leak, if it's persistent after such a case, what do you do? Is there anything specific you do? Or call the neurosurgeons. <laughs> or do you have a time frame? That's what I meant to ask. What's your time frame? Of course. So. Uh, this, this is um, so our, I, I only know that our neurosurgeons, uh, they wait and they say that 70 to 80 percent just stop. If it's uh, a permanent leakage, then they would go for um, a revision transcranially. Yeah. yeah. Or would you Rudy, consider the ENT people to ENT people to do it trans uh, nasal? Also an option. Yes, also an option. So we have we have a board in our hospital. It's it's for all frontal basal fractures and tumors. And uh, there's a radiologist, there's an ENT doctor, and a neurosurgeon, and us. And such cases will be discussed there. And um, we have also some cases where the ENT, they developed like a, a nasal septum flap uh, and, and sutured it. And we had cases where the neurosurgeons come from cranially, but then together with us blocking it uh, and they were suturing the dura. So there are so different options, but I think if you have an interdisciplinary team, that's, that's the best you can do. Talk to your neurosurgeons, talk to, to your ENT doctors. They have some very good ideas sometimes. So if you need to do something secondary after you know a NOA fracture, would yeah. you consider only bony reconstruction or would you consider some other adjunct soft tissue uh, procedures like you know fat fillers or something like that? Um, we, we don't have, I personally, and I know in our department, we don't have uh, any big experience with fillers. So I, I'm the wrong person for that. So what do you I do in thought, case if there is a you know a depression or something afterwards maybe then i know you you mean in the nose or in, in what the nose the nose the depression on the here on the uh, on the, the yeah the root of the nose the root the yeah root the, root of the, nose. the root of the nose yeah yeah sometimes those bone grafts they have resorbed and then you would go for another one okay yeah Rudy, what is the incidence of uh, relapse when you fix the uh, uh, NOE fracture? Relapse in a traumatic telecanthus. How much is the relapse? Have you? What is your experience? You must have seen so many patients. After proper fixation, what is the incidence of relapse? Of the medial cantilever ligament? Yes. If it's fixed with a wire? Uh, fixed with a wire? Uh, 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 yes. Uh, any any type of fixation, which whichever you prefer. Uh, so. Uh, um, I, I can't. I cannot remember a case where, over years, we have several cases which are more than five or even ten years. I, I can't recall a single case where um, the fixation has has gone or ruptured. Maybe it, during time, and the wire has ruptured, but the, the scarring has taken in and uh, it's fixed. But I, I cannot remember if it's placed correctly. The wire is form stable, and that's why it's used. Um, by us, but oh. um, but we don't know exactly because not all patients come back. That's the same problem in in every country. Um, we only have a few that come back, and in those it, it has worked pretty well. And I can't remember a single case where we had to do a medial cantilever ligament fixation a second time. Yeah. Um, so Thank the you. wire, if placed correctly, is stable. This is what very if, yeah. Yeah. What if uh, you have a post-operative uh, 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 epicanthal fold on either of the side, and the soft tissue? From you you mean like fold a fold here? Yeah, epicanthal fold uh, in uh, that covers the uh, medial canthus, like a soft tissue problem. After the fixation with the wire. Yeah. Yeah. Wait. First time. Wait. And if it doesn't uh, um, resolve by its own, then, but, but to be honest, I have not, we have not have had such a case. I can't, I can't remember one. 
Okay. What would you do? What would you do? So uh, the epicanthal fold, if you see the NOE is, uh, I'm not talking only about the medial transfer syndrome. If there is a depressed fracture of the root of the nose, and if that is not adequately uh, corrected, so the, as you said, the soft tissue, the nasal soft tissue can uh, fall back onto the medial uh, uh, canthal region, yeah. right? Which, which forms the epicanthal fold. So one option is to augment the nose again, or the plastic surgeons could consider uh, soft tissue procedures like the yeah. uh, jump, jumping man's, uh, you know, uh, uh, plasty uh, or, or yeah. plastic procedures. Yeah. Okay. Now I, I didn't, I didn't get in, in your um, idea that um, the dorsum was gone. So I think, yeah. Okay. So I'm, I'm sorry. I have to, I have to leave. If this is okay for you. Yeah. Because yeah. <laughs> no worries. Have to. Thank you. That was exhaustive. You have run a marathon. Thanks, thanks a lot, yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck with the case. Thank you Thank very you. much. It was a pleasure you know, one, uh, talking to you. One, one final question was if you can record that surgery and play it live sometime. That's what somebody has asked. Yeah. Us. <laughs> Pardon, sorry, Possibly. I didn't get that. What? If you can record the decompression now and maybe play it to us later. That was a question, if possible. So today in, in, in Germany, we have a very uh, Catholic holiday. So okay. we don't have our so, photographers yeah. here. We are like emergency uh, set up. So today is the death of Jesus. I don't know if you know that. So it's the Friday. Good Friday. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Good Friday. Good Friday. Good Friday yeah. And no Good one is Friday. here. No one is yeah. here. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. I'm, but I try to do it with the phone. Yeah. Yeah. No, yeah, that's fine. Whatever. Thank you. Have okay. a great day okay. and a happy Easter. Thanks very much. Stay safe. And please, if you see any patient name, because I was showing the CT scan on my screen, if you could remove this from, no, no. from any taping. Yeah? Yes. Because I was not, I was not yeah, yeah. looking at it. Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank All you the so best much. Happy Easter. happy Easter. Amit, happy Easter. talk to you. <laughs> I will I mean, tell them. Bye bye. Bye bye. He'll tell them. <laughs> yep. Thank you. So, Kanan, uh, the co host, Pritham uh, Praveen, stay back. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, what about uh, Rajshekar? Is there? Yes. We yeah, have Rajshekar and Yesh to come online. Rajshekar and Yesh. Or shall we do with a new meeting ID? Yes. Shall we go, go in with a new meeting ID? Pr 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 Pramod, do you want to tell when all are there about the other uh, next That's meeting? What... Just when everyone is there. I think we will do that. that. We will we'll wind up. I'm going to create a new meeting. I'm going okay. to end, okay. end the okay. meeting. Please end the meeting, Pramod. Please. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Good.